Hey, Zach. Good morning, Councilman. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm great, except that for some reason I cannot, I cannot even pull up the uh, Prime Gov login. Yeah. You have aware of any issues? We're, we, are, we are aware of, of something going on, and, and the clerk's office is working through that right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, for council that just logged on, we are having a few issues with Prime Gov, and so you may not be able to log in, or you may get the spending will. So the clerk's office is looking at that. Zach, this is Carrie. Can you make me a co-host, please? Yes, I will do that. Thank you.
Okay, we're having some issues with PrimeGov, but that does not preclude us from proceeding. Uh, we can take voice votes, at least up front. Okay, Councilman Stone, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up, if you can. Okay. First of all, I've got to make a quick announcement. Thank you for joining us for the City of Oklahoma City's teleconference City Council meeting. Uh, if the teleconference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to later today, March 30th at 1 o'clock p.m. via teleconference, unless we had the opportunity to tell you a different time. The agenda and documents are located on OKC.gov. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item, public hearing, or to speak under citizens to be heard, please call 405-297-2391 or text 405-219-7987 or email cityclerk at okc.gov. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to comment. After three minutes, the speaker's microphone will be muted. A 30-second reminder will be provided prior to the microphone being muted. I ask that all participants, except the council members, keep their phones on mute until they are recognized to speak. Uh, please press star six to speak. Council will be allowed to ask questions or comment at any time, of course. First, I want to welcome our good friend, Pastor Derek Scobie of Ebenezer Baptist Church to offer us an invocation this morning. And Pastor Scobie, it's uh, wonderful to see you. And thank you so much good for morning. joining us today. Good morning. Good to see you, Mr. Mayor, and all who are on this morning. Uh, let us go uh, to the Lord in prayer. Eternal and loving God, our Father, we humbly come before you on this day, first of all, God, to say thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We certainly thank you for your mercy, which endureth unto all generations. Dear God, we come uh, confessing that we need you in a very special way. Uh, we need you in our city as a whole. We need you, God, to move within our hearts, our minds, to give us the direction that we need to go. Um, each and every uh, representative on here today. And God, we certainly desire to follow you uh, in your truth. And we know that your truth is the only truth. God, I ask that you would just bless this meeting now, allow for all of the participants to be able to do things that would, would really bring honor to you. Uh, God, we pray that we would all have the hearts to serve um, your people here in this great city of Oklahoma City. Thank you for our mayor. Thank you for all of our city council uh, representatives. Thank you, God, for all um, city officials, employees, each and every one who plays the part that you have called for them to play. And God, we just wanna say we love you, we thank you, we adore you, we magnify your name. Give us all servants' hearts. It's in Jesus' name that I offer this prayer. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scobie. Have a great day. Okay. Uh, I call this meeting of the City Council to order. And we'll start with Office of the Mayor. We have quite a few items here today. Um, first, let's handle something that's uh, not to be adopted, just a proclamation. We have Child Abuse Prevention Month, and uh, we have a proclamation to that effect, declaring that month in the month of April. And I would ask the clerk to read the proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas Oklahoma City's future prosperity depends on nurturing the healthy development of the more than 162,000 children currently living, growing, and learning within our community. And whereas research shows that safe, nurturing relationships and stimulating stable environments improve brain development and child well being, while neglectful or abusive experiences and unstable or stressful environments increase the odds of poor childhood outcomes. And whereas the abuse and neglect of children can cause severe, costly, and lifelong problems affecting all of society, including physical and mental health problems, 
school failure, and criminal behavior. And whereas research also shows that parents and caregivers who have social networks and know how to seek help in times of trouble are more resilient and better able to provide safe environments and nurturing experiences for their children. And whereas individuals, businesses, schools, and faith-based and community organizations must make children a top priority and take action to support the physical, social, emotional, and educational development and competency of all children. And whereas during the month of April, the city of Oklahoma City, Parent Promise to Prevent Child Abuse Oklahoma, the Exchange Club of Oklahoma City, the Downtown Oklahoma City Exchange Club, and the Oklahoma State Department of Health, in collaboration with their citywide partners, will be engaging individuals and communities throughout the city in a coordinated effort to prevent child abuse and neglect by promoting awareness of healthy child development, positive parenting practices, and the types of support families need within their communities. And whereas I encourage all citizens of Oklahoma City to recognize that prevention starts with each of us. Now, therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim April 2021 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Oklahoma City. Thank you, Amy. And I see that we have Sherry Fair on the line from Parent Promise. Sherry, if you wouldn't mind saying a few words. Yes, I would. Thank you. And Mayor, I'd like to thank you for bringing child abuse prevention to the forefront this April because, um, as we know, that's a really important issue and it's become even more important this past year when we have a lot of lot more children living in isolation. And so um, our, our mission, I'd like to say, is to prevent child abuse and neglect. And we do that through home-based parent education and support. And so, of course, we've been doing that virtually through throughout last year. So that's still good that we've been in contact with a lot of our families because they they struggle when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. So it's been great that we've been there. And this is always a great reminder that um, child abuse prevention is everybody's responsibility. And so, you know, if you see something, say something, but most important, do everything we can to keep our children safe. And just as a show of support, Mayor, if everybody this Thursday on April 1st wears blue, then um, everyone will know that we support our children and we support them growing up healthy and growing into productive citizens, their, our future. So I just wanna thank you for all your support through the years and that even extends to your family support. And so we greatly appreciate everybody and I thank the whole city council for working through this year and helping to lead the city through these uh, difficult times. Well, thank you, Sherry, for those kind words and thank you for all you and your organization do and, and we're very, very grateful and it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with you through the years. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Well, okay, now we have uh, a couple of sad resolutions. We are going to honor a couple of longstanding members of council, one of which is, is one of the longest serving members of council in the city's history. Uh, as they move on to a new chapter. And that of course is Councilman James Greiner and Councilman Larry McAtee. And we'll take them one by one. James is at his home. Uh, Larry is here in City Hall and we're gonna join him here in a moment, but we'll take them in order. And item 3A is a resolution of commendation for James Greiner, Ward 1 Council Member. Uh, and I would ask Amy to read that resolution. Uh, we'll adopt it. And then I expect we'll have a few words to say. Whereas James Greiner has represented the residents of Ward 1 since April 2013 and was reelected in 2017. And whereas Councilman Greiner worked to reactivate neighborhood associations in his ward and fought for policy changes relating to vacant and abandoned buildings to enhance the safety and appearance of neighborhoods in his ward. And whereas Councilman Greiner championed efforts to improve the quality of life in Oklahoma City through MAPS 4, Better Streets and Safer Cities, the Public Safety Sales Tax, and the 2017 GEO Bond issue. And whereas Councilman Greiner has been part of Oklahoma City's growth 
during his tenure by serving on many of the city's boards and trusts, including the Public Property Authority, Environmental Assistance Trust, Municipal Facilities Authority, Council Finance Committee, the Arts Commission, and the Neighborhood Conservation Council Committee. And whereas Councilman Greiner earned a BFA degree in graphic design from Oklahoma State University and a master's degree in economics from Oklahoma Christian University. And whereas both lifelong Oklahomans, James and wife Katie were born and raised in Oklahoma City where they are now raising their four children. In addition to his work with the Oklahoma City Council, he serves his community as a member of Covenant Community Church. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend James Greiner for his eight years of dedicated service to the residents of Ward 1 and the citizens of Oklahoma City and wish him all the best. Why don't we uh, adopt that real quick and then we will have some comments from obviously from Councilman Greiner as well as uh, his colleagues. And I think we're gonna do a voice vote on this one. And so, unfortunately, Councilman Greiner, I believe we're gonna start with you, but Amy, would you call, call the roll? Councilman Greiner. This is my weirdest vote in eight years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Councilman Cooper. Yes. Councilman McAtee. Yes. Councilman Stone. Yes. Councilman Greenwell. Yes. Councilwoman Hammond. Yes. Councilwoman Nice. Yes. Councilman Stone Cipher. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Um, well, maybe we'll start with comments from others and then close with Councilman Greiner. Uh, anybody, just, I just jump in if there's anything you'd, you'd like to say. This is Mark Stonecipher here. James, uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for your service. I wanted to thank you for uh, helping me over the last six years. Your insight has been incredible. Um, Especially, uh, you helped me a lot with issues on uh, uh, land use uh, and things that were going on in our ward and your ward. And so um, I appreciate your insight. I, I think we just saw it a minute ago. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed so much about James was his sense of humor off the horseshoe. He had an ability to make staff laugh, especially Debbie Martin. Uh, he had the ability to make all of us laugh. And so uh, I've enjoyed working with you. Uh, I want to tell your wife, Katie, thank you. I feel like uh, I know your family. I got to know your wife. I got to know your kids. I met your father. And so you're a great family person. And uh, most of all, I want to thank you for giving your best for OKC. Thanks, Mark. So, James, I'd just like to say uh, how much I appreciated you through the years of being able to serve, serve with you. And... Uh, especially your willingness, I think, to help me understand like where you were coming from on some different issues. Um, just your ability to help me out and, and think, think through some, some of the different, uh, uh, especially more, I would say, contagious issues that we've had. And uh, like Mark said, your sense of humor off the shoe is, uh, for those who don't know, you, you're just a pretty funny down to earth guy and I really do appreciate that. I appreciate uh, you having your office door open, you know, all the time so that when I did have, have questions on a particular vote, I could always come talk to you about them, whether we agreed or disagreed on the outcome, uh, you always welcomed that conversation. So thank you for your service and uh, good luck to you in the future, James. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Well, you know, I'll, okay. oh, go ahead, Councilman. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, uh, James, it's been a pleasure. I know um, we didn't always agree, but we agreed to disagree. So that's one thing that I can appreciate uh, from you and working with you. And, and uh, while you're a man of few words, <laughs> for the most part, uh, when, when you were, uh, we would talk, you would 
we'd have a great conversation. So I, I really appreciate that. And uh, a lot of people don't realize or know in, that I, I knew about you before I met you uh, due to some extended friends that we have in common. Uh, so when I finally got to meet you, I, I felt like I knew you as well. It's like, I know, I know who he is now. So I really appreciate you and good luck to you uh, in all your endeavors and and may, uh, may, may the Lord be with you uh, for all of the things with you and your family. So thank you again for all that you have done for our city. Thank you. James Larry McAtee, it's been a pleasure serving with you. It's been especially enjoyable to watch you interact with your children and what a godly father and a godly husband should do. As you go forward from this day, uh, I wish you God's best. And it's been a pleasure knowing you and working with you. God bless you. Thanks, Larry. James, this is David Greenwell. Uh, thank you for your eight years of service. Uh, it's especially hard for those who are working uh, and continuing to serve in the capacity on the city council. And I appreciate your ability to to merge the two lives, that being a, uh, a member of the city council, as well as uh, taking care of your family and your, your job. And you've certainly shown a high level of consistency in your service with the city council and you've just been a tremendous leader. Um, so thank you, uh, we'll miss you and good luck with, uh, with the rest of your life. I know it'll be successful and uh, thank you again. Thanks, David. Uh, other James, I, uh, you and I ideologically have, we're just not, right? We're not. And um, I knew that going into uh, the night I won so imagine my incredible surprise when you were at my watch party. Um, I mean, genuine surprise. Um, and you were so kind. And I knew then that um, we wouldn't be yelling at each other. And even when we disagreed. And, um, and we have disagreed. In fact, you remind me of a friend I had in my... Uh, uh, AP English classes growing up. So thanks for bringing those memories back to the forefront. Um, so no, I, I, I uh, truly that night when you uh, showed up at that watch party to say congratulations and then um, introduce yourself and stay for a while, actually. Um, that gave me some hope, um, not just for our relationship on uh, city council, but hope for those of us across the city who come from different perspectives that um, we can break bread together and actually listen to one another. Um, and um, so I, I will, that memory is never going to go away. And I really appreciate you for, for, um, for that memory. So thank you so much. Thanks, James. I, I'd already had a lot of experience um, with your predecessor of getting along with somebody who uh, we were on different sides of the political spectrum normally. So um, I figured that uh, we could do the same. So I appreciate that. I would just add, and then I think the city manager wants to say something as well, that um, I'll echo what everybody said about your sense of humor. And those who may watch council meetings may think, what in the world are they talking about? Like he is definitely not cracking a lot of jokes on the horseshoe, but he, you are, you are a wonderful person to visit with. And you also, you're not just somebody who's funny. You also laugh at my jokes and make me feel funny. And I appreciate that. And you're a good friend in that regard. Um, but more importantly, you leave a great legacy here. I mean, this has been an impactful eight years. You, you were at the center of the discussion about MAPS 4, about better streets, safer city. And, and you, you worked with people, you know, you, you, you had obviously, as has been already alluded to, you had your ideological perspective, but you were ultimately for those packages because um, there was, you felt that 
uh, you know, there was enough in there that met the needs of Ward 1. And you met people in the middle, which is how the only way this whole thing works. And I've always really appreciated that you embraced uh, that spirit of compromise and that spirit of, of getting things done that I think has been so important to this city overall for a quarter century. And, you know, a lot of people forget you came in here, you know, you defeated an incumbent that people liked. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people didn't know what to do with you. And um, you, you turned out, I think, to be such a great council member and such a great person uh, to work with and, and uh, a leader in Ward 1 and in this community. And you're still relatively young, so you've got uh, obviously many more chapters ahead of you. And I hope you will always look back fondly on this time you spent at City Hall. And certainly, we're all very grateful for your willingness to serve and the, the, all the neighborhood associations and all the council meetings and all the things you've done over eight years uh, for very little pay. And uh, it is certainly, it truly is a public service. And we're, we're so grateful to you as a public servant. And I'm so grateful to you as a friend. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mayor. Dick Johnson, I just wanted to express my appreciation to you. Um, I appreciated working with you before, you know, my previous roles in finance and just your dedication to service, your dedication to doing the right thing and um, working and holding us accountable to make sure that we're managing a way that, that we can provide services into the future. Um, I, I just can't imagine that the, I appreciate all the council members and what you all do to serve and, and the extra time that it requires of you in this dedication, doing it, especially working full time job with a young family and all. You just set a great standard for us. And uh, I appreciate your friendship, appreciate your leadership for the city. So thank you. Now, to, I don't know, there's no non awkward way to do this, but we were told that we didn't take a motion on the uh, resolution and we have to do it again. And I want to do that before you speak, James. So uh, is there a motion to adopt the resolution honoring Councilman Gray? Move the item. All right, we've got a motion in a second. Now we'll call the roll again. So you get to cast your awkward vote twice, James. All right, yes. Yes. Claire, Claire please. She, she just doing it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor Holt. <laughs> yes. All right, is that good? I heard a lot of yes, or do you need to go through it? All right. All right, go through the roll call then. Okay. Council Member Greiner? Yes. Council Member Cooper? Yes. Council Member McAtee? Yes. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Greenwell? Yes. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Nice? Yes. Council Member Stonecipher? Yes, please. Motion passes. Yes, okay. Motion passes unanimously. Resolution is adopted, and now Councilman Griner closes it. Well, uh, thank you guys for all those kind words and voting on that resolution twice. Um, feel doubly honored. Um, but <laughs> my, um, you know, the the time on council has really been a special time in my life, and there's a lot of people that I I need to thank, and you guys have mentioned some of them already, but. Um, First, my wife and kids. Uh, uh, Katie is extremely special to me, and without her encouragement and support, it uh, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, and so I, I thank them uh, tremendously. Also, my parents um, and uh, the rest of my family and friends, kind of my circle of uh, of support. Um, they've been extremely supportive of me doing all this, and uh, I couldn't have done it without them. Uh, thirdly, uh, and David kind of hit on this, is my uh, my two employers during this eight eight years was Hobby Lobby and Paycom, and uh, you know the without the understanding of my immediate supervisors and uh, my coworkers, um, uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to do both, and uh, and and so my my teams on. Uh, within my jobs uh, did, a, did a tremendous job of uh, supporting me whenever I wasn't there. And then the last one, uh, the city staff, they, uh, you know, we talk about them all the time uh, and rightfully so. They are extremely 
talented. Um, they always have answers to my questions. Um, they always know who to, who to contact whenever I have issues. They're always really, really responsive to concerns that I have and constituents have. And, um, and I really wanna uh, point out uh, Debbie Martin and the entire city council support staff. They are extremely, extremely helpful. They're always wanting to help. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so I really wanna thank them. And again, the, the last eight years have been really, really a special time in my life. I, uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. And uh, this is a really, really great organization that uh, I'm glad that I can say that I've been a part of. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, I'm gonna walk into the other room real quick and we are now going to honor Larry McAtee. And uh, hold on, just 20 seconds. Does anyone know any good jokes? I'm kidding. Reiner, one one more for the road. Give us one for the road. Are we on video? Okay. Play them up in front of a crowd. Let's turn up somebody's sound so I can hear what's. All right. Whereas Larry McAtee has served the residents of Ward 3 since April 2001 and was reelected four times. During his tenure, he attended more than 90% of Ward 3 neighborhood meetings and neighborhood night out events and responded to every citizen call, email, or request on the day it was received. And whereas Councilman McAtee's 20 years of service as a city council member is the second longest tenure in that position in Oklahoma City history. And he is the only member of the city council to serve through the creation and passage of three MAPS initiatives and the arrival of the NBA in Oklahoma City. And whereas in addition to the MAPS initiatives, Councilman McAtee has championed a number of issues, including the public nuisance ordinance, an ordinance to facilitate safety at apartment complexes, and advocated for apartment community associations, an ordinance for litter on a stick, ordinances related to vacant, abandoned, and derelict properties. He also has been a stalwart champion for the Big League City Initiative, investment in sports facilities, the 2007 and 2017 geo bond issues, better streets, safer cities, and a public safety sales tax. And whereas Councilman McAtee has helped guide the city's economic growth as chair of the Airport Trust and the Economic Development Trust, he is a member of the City Council Legislative Committee and has met annually with Oklahoma's congressional members to advance the city's federal legislative agenda. And whereas Councilman McAtee has been a voice and advocate for Oklahoma City on a national level through his involvement with the National League of Cities, from 2002 to 2014. During this time, he served as a member, vice chair and chair of the Human Development Committee, a member of the Board of Directors, the FAIR Committee, No Child Left Behind Committee and Large Cities Council. And whereas Councilman McAtee's local influence includes roles with the Oklahoma Municipal League, the Weed and Seed Board of Directors, the West Oklahoma City Rotary Club, and he is a member of the Quell Springs Baptist Church. And whereas Councilman McAtee earned a master's degree in management from New York University Graduate School of Business Administration and a BA in public and international affairs from Princeton University and has been an adjunct professor at Oklahoma City University. And whereas Councilman McAtee would be the first to tell you that his tireless work on behalf of Ward 3 residents would not have been possible without the love and support of his wife, Joanne. The couple have three daughters, 12 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Larry McAtee for his 20 years of dedicated service to the residents of Ward 3 and the citizens of Oklahoma City 
and wish him all the best. Okay. We want to do that unmuted. Okay. All right. Well, uh, why don't we take a motion and a second to adopt the resolution and we'll take the roll and then we'll obviously go through the horseshoe and hear from everybody. Yeah, Adam. Second. All right. Got a motion and a second. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Holt? Yes. Councilman Greiner? Yes. Councilmember Cooper? Yes. Councilmember McAtee? Yes. Councilmember Stone? Yes. Councilmember Greenwell? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Yes. Councilmember Nice? Yes. Councilmember Stonecipher? Yes. Done? Motion passes. All right. Thank you, Amy. Uh, resolution was unanimously adopted, and thank you for voting for it as well. <laughs> um, if everybody would just jump in as, as we did before, and then we'll, we'll obviously we'll close with Councilman McAtee. So, how about it? Larry, this is Mark Stone Cipher. Um, I want to say thank you for an incredible 20 years of service. I have enjoyed so much our work together the last six years and it's been an honor to serve with you on the council on various committees trust and boards uh, but most of all it's been an honor to serve with serve you with you as a friend uh, and i mean that truly a dear friend um, your insight uh, will be sorely missed uh, what you taught me has been amazing over the last six years uh, one thought comes to mind is uh, many times when i've gone to you with questions um, I learned how great a listener you are, but my favorite uh, statement you would make is, have you ever thought about the unintended consequences, Mark? And then would discuss that with me. So I have learned so very, very much uh, from you, and I am very thankful for that. Um, I would like to also tell Joanne, uh, I appreciate her patience, her support, her strength over the year. I think uh, I think actually we got two council people. We got Larry and we got Joanne. Uh, I'm very ex excited about uh, the two of you having a bright future, a wonderful future. And um, I guess I'll end with saying um, thank, we thank you for always uh, serving OKC to your best. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Larry. Um, when I first got elected, uh, in 2013, Mayor Cornette was really quick to connect me to you. Um, and I think it's because he knew we would see most issues in a, um, in a similar way. And kind of like Mark said, that you, you really did uh, teach me um, how, to, how to do things uh, on the council. And so uh, Mayor Cornette was right in, in connecting us. And, and I think the things that are going to be missed the most about you is really just your integrity, your professionalism, knowledge, experience, reliability, and a calming voice um, are the things that the, this council is going to miss from you. And I, I, I wish you and Joanne the best in the next chapter of your lives. So, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Larry, I can't tell you... Uh how much I've enjoyed being able to sit next to you the last four, four years. Um, and in those four years, I think that Larry's only probably kicked me under the table really hard like three times, which uh, I consider a great thing. Um, but I can tell you one of the things I will miss most is with your history with the city, uh, your experience, your thoughtfulness, it's always nice to be able to talk to you and, you know, someone will come up with a great idea, maybe me sometimes or what I thought was a great idea. Uh, and then in talking to you about it, you could go, you know, we did that 15 years ago and here were the results of that, um, which makes you think, okay, I've got to go back. I've got to rethink this. I've got to work on it some more. So uh, that is certainly, at least from my standpoint, certainly going to be missed greatly. 
I wish you and Joanne nothing but the best. Uh, and, and she's certainly been a big part of, I know, supporting you. Uh, and, and it's always been great to have her around as well. But uh, just thank you again for your service, Larry. And uh, I wish you and Joanne nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Larry, this is David Greenwell. Um, thank you for your many years of service and especially your leadership. Uh, the times I've got to work with you where you chaired a committee or a board uh, have just been very enjoyable. And I've, I've gained a lot just to be around you. Uh, it's great that uh, a man of faith like you uh, have been able to demonstrate that throughout your career, and I respect that so much. Uh, and so you've got that strong experience and professionalism, but yet you're the best example of someone working with their community and attending uh, neighborhood association meetings, getting the perspective of all the, the citizens in your ward, uh, I admire you for that. Uh, I wish I had the time uh, and ability to do many of the things you've been able to accomplish. So we will certainly miss you and uh, good luck. And, and certainly we'll miss uh, Joanne as well. She's just a great lady and we've enjoyed both of you so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Mr. McAtee, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your service. Um, also, I, I can honestly say there have been a couple times where you have come to my office and, and we would talk some things through. So I appreciate that. Um, and with you being able to uh, just talk about it. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of times we have, uh, especially now that we haven't been able to see a lot of each other, you and I have pretty much been at the at city hall together so we get a lot of time to talk so um it's been a pleasure to to know you and also your lovely wife and family i think i've met at least one of your granddaughters and um some of your other family members but it's it's great to know you so i i also one thing i didn't realize too when i was at the radio station i interviewed you i was a part of uh, one of the groups when, when you came in to talk about i feel like you talked about your book uh, so we came, you came in and I, now I remember that, that memory of you coming in talking about your book and, and I appreciate that. And I have my own autographed copy. So I thank you for that as well. <laughs> uh, so looking forward to, to seeing more of, of you enjoying this, I guess it's a newfound retirement, if you will, uh, for you and your family. Congratulations and thank you again for your service. Thank you, Nikki. It's been a pleasure to meet you and work with you. Uh, Councilman, I'll just say uh, and echo what others have said. Thank you for your service. Um, I think some of the memories that stick out the most to me, which actually now that I'm thinking about pretty similar to Councilman uh, Griner, um, when my mom and I attended our first Thunder Games as uh, after I took office, I remember you had grandchildren there. And I remember that's also, I believe, where I met um, Katie for the first time with James. Um, and so it just sort of humanized each of you in some ways that were very important to me and to my mom, because neither of us come from a world of, of politics. Um, so I just remember, I think it was your granddaughter uh, offered, she kept seeing my mom and I trying to awkwardly take selfies of each other at the Thunder game and your granddaughter stepped in and, and she's like, I got it. And that was very kind. Um, and then, you know, like James, you and I uh, find ourselves ideologically uh, in disagreement and sometimes on issues that are like near and dear to my, my core. At the same time, uh, the two memories I would want to bring up, one was a Sunday, because of course it would be a Sunday. Um, you and I had, I think about an hour, maybe two hour conversation um, about government, and we each listen to each other. I mean, I'm, I'm talking like some deep Adam Smith, like Edmund Burke, 
conversation to listen to each other. And it was clear that you were actually responding to specific things I was saying and vice versa. I think religion came up as well. And I don't remember either of us screaming at each other. It was a very deep, thoughtful conversation. Um, and that, that really, I, I live for those sort of moments and I wish more of us were able to have those sorts of moments with each other. Um, the other thing I will always remember, and it, it's truly one of my favorite moments since taking office, and I've told you this before, it was you on Flashpoint. And you have to keep in mind, I think without understanding like where you and I disagree on so much, it, this moment that I'm about to describe won't have the power that it is. But when you, the Sunday before the MAPS score vote, spoke to your service and within a biblical context, number one, you explained why you were retiring when you were and you cited service within relationship to your sacred text. Um, but then you went further and explained on the issue of homelessness, which as we know is a, um, an issue that is, is facing not just our city, but cities all across um, our country. And you know, it's the result of a, at least a good 40 years worth of disinvestment you got up there on Flashpoint and you just said, look, I can't promise you all that this is going to, that MAP score is going to fix everything with homelessness. But you said that you would rather try this and go down fighting than do nothing at all. I, I'm telling you, it, 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 was a, it, was, it was a really powerful moment for me. And you kind of gave me one more boost to go into that Tuesday uh, that vote. I mean, it was anyone go find that archive of that moment. It was, it was a very persuasive from the heart moment. Uh, so, um, I just say that to you because I know maybe there might be times you might've not thought I was listening to what you were saying, but I was always listening even when we disagreed in that moment, um, on flashpoint will always, always, always be, Issue. And again, thank you. And um, thanks to Joanne um, as well for all of her kindness. Thank you, James. Well, I'll just say on a, on a professional level, the things that we talked about in this resolution are kind of unbelievable. Uh, I, I mean, there'll never be another council member or mayor who will be here for the creation of three different MAPS programs. That institutional knowledge that you brought to our conversations is remarkable. And the legacy you leave as a council member in that regard is, is really special. The, uh, oh, little sound issue here. When I, when I think about, I mean, this is, I, I believe this is true because nothing about you would ever be untrue, but that you attended more than 90% of neighborhood meetings and neighborhood nights out in your time as council member is a testament to the kind of council member you were. And the Ward 3, you know, really knew you and, and loved you over this 20 years. And that's how you get reelected for that time, period of time. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that we have somebody like you and that we have so many, we have had so many council members like you, but you stand above the rest, you really do. And on a personal level, you've been a part of my entire adult life. <laughs> I walked into this city hall at age 26. And, and I'm still here. And, I'm still here. Um, and, and you've been there the whole time. And um, your integrity and your principles and your marriage with Joanne, all of those things are so inspirational to me and will always be a part of my public service. And I hope you know what an influence you've been on me. And thank you for your friendship and your service to our city. And of course, thank you to Joanne, as has already been noted, is, is almost like the co-council member. And we are we love her so much and are so grateful for her as well. And uh, thank you, thank you. I, I expect Craig probably has something he wants to say as well. I'd just like to say thank you, Councilman, for your years of service. It's amazing to see someone serve 20 years and serve the way that you served. Um, you served on so many different trusts. You served mayor was talking about how many uh, neighborhood meetings you've been in. I've been in meetings with you 
uh, many different times in neighborhoods. And I've been in a few where, where, that were very difficult, where the neighbors were upset about something. The way you handled yourself with integrity and humility and always treated everyone with respect. And I really appreciate that. I think as a Christian, you set a great example for others to follow and you stay faithful and true to your beliefs, but you do it always with respect and with grace and kindness. I think the greatest thing that could be said about you is you're a servant and you set a great example for all of us um, as a servant. So thank you for your leadership and friendship with the city. Well, thank you for those kind comments and thank all the council for their support. Thank you to the staff of Oklahoma City who uh, raised me from someone who knew nothing about city government to someone who knows a little bit about it. <laughs> And uh, they were very patient and kind and creative. And together we were able to accomplish some great things. One of the highlights of my career, if you will, was my ability to uh, go with my wife to the neighborhood meetings. She actually was more of a better interface with the neighbors than I was. And uh, together we were able to, we hope, collect ideas that will have uh, lasting results for the citizens of Oklahoma City. The reason I'm leaving right now, I'm a Christian and believe that God directs the steps of his children. For some reason this past summer, uh, I was prompted that that was all my last campaign that I would not be running for reelection. And that's why I have resigned uh, this way. Looking forward to watching you all carry on the banner and uh, shine the light bright of what a city like Oklahoma City can do for its people and for an example to the world. God bless you and thank you for your support. And thank you, Mayor, for your help and your support also. It's been a joy and it's a privilege and I look forward to watching what you all are gonna accomplish far greater things than what we have done this far. Thank you all. Thank you. And a, a virtual applause to you and Councilman Greiner. Thank you so much for your service. All right, well, um, why don't we, let's take like a full couple of minutes. He probably wants to go back to his office, you can go back to your office. And yes, sir. Let's, let's kind of just pause for about two minutes and then we'll take up the rest of the agenda. Thank you, everybody. So a council person walks into city hall. I'm kidding. It looks like PrimeGov is kind of working. Are we still working towards using PrimeGov? I'm able to pull it up. It just took a little bit. Mickey said it looks like it's coming up a little bit, but it isn't for everyone yet. So we'll we'll keep working it. Okay, thank you. It looks like I'm in, which I hadn't been earlier. So yeah, yeah. Yes, Mary, if you want to try it, we can. I think that's my Can you see your Mayor Phil is logged in. So, so should we all try to log on if we can't? Okay, got it. I just got in as well. Stone Sapper and Michael Go ahead. Can you see everyone here? Everybody, 
Okay, it looks like we've got everyone in except for Councilman Stonecipher and Council McAtee. Council McAtee is still probably trying to get settled in his office. So we'll try to get there. Okay, I see Councilman McAtee has settled and I'm told we can try to do prime gov for our votes moving forward. If we still have, if he's still getting signed in, we could always do him by voice. Um, and Councilman Stonecipher, are we seeing him in the system now too? Not yet, we can do. We're not there, we're trying. Okay, well, we can do you by voice for a little bit. That's not too big a deal, okay. All right, we're going to pick it up at item 3C. 3C through 3L are all essentially appointments. Officially, 3C is a notification. This is in keeping with the charter. Councilwoman Nice will become the vice mayor, effective at our next council meeting. And then items D through L are all appointments uh, to, in this case, the Civic Center Foundation, the Electrical Appeals and Code Commission, Emergency Medical Services Authority, the MAP3 Citizens Advisory Board, um, also the MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board. This is also a, a council appointment and citizen appointment. The MAPS 4 Citizens Advisory Board, this is just reappointments uh, of the first, uh, the first wave of reappointments from that board. The Mechanical Code Review and Appeals Commission, the Oklahoma City Game and Fish Commission, and the Plumbing Code Review and Appeals Commission. We could take all those with one motion. And is that coming up virtually for people? The opportunity to make a motion? It's not up on mine yet. Mine. Okay. So if it's not coming up, I'll make the, the motion to approve. Dina, we need to move that motion to the header because that's the active item. Okay. Our screen is stuck right now. All right, we'll do it orally. Okay, uh, we got a motion from Councilman Stone. Is there a second? Second. All right, got a motion and a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Holt? Yes. Council Member Greiner? Yes. Council Member Cooper? Yes. Council Member McAtee? Yes. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Greenwell? Yes. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Nice? Yes. Council Member Stonecipher? Yes. Can you repeat your vote, Council Member yes. Stone? Okay. Motion carries. Motion. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, that concludes Office of the Mayor. And now we will move on to item four, Journal of Council Proceedings. We have two items, A and B, we could take with one motion and we'll do it verbally. Yeah. Oh, wait, oh, wait. We've got, I see a window. Well, it's a start anyway. Is anyone able to actually make a motion yet? Not, Not yet. yet. All right, we'll, st we'll stick with verbal, I guess. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, do we have a motion and a second on the minutes, Journal of Council Proceedings? Motion so, approved. Right, okay. Motion and a second, Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Holt? Yes. Council Member Greiner? Yes. Council Member Cooper? Yes. Council Member McAtee? Yes. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Greenwell? Yes. Council Member Hammond? Yes. Council Member Nice? 
Yes. Council member Stone Cipher. Yes. Motion passes. All right, motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. Item five, request for uncontested continuances. Mr. City Manager, I see we have item 9L already on the agenda. Beyond that, the floor is yours. Yes, so we have um, on dilapidated structures, unsecured structures and abandoned buildings, all these items will be stricken from the agenda. Starting with page 17, item 10, AH1, dilapidated structures, item D, 1622 Northwest 3rd Street to re-notify the owner. Item F, 200 Northeast 16th Street, the owner is removed. Item G, 4045 Southwest 24th Street, the owner is removed. Item H, 1401 Northeast 29th Street, the owner is removed. On item nine, AI1, unsecured structures, this is on page 18. All of these items are stricken. Item B, 5521 Dimple Drive, the owner is secured. Item E, 1213 North Indiana Avenue, the owner is secured. Item F, 1110 Linwood Boulevard, uh, the owner is secured. Item G, 3124 North May Avenue, the owner is secured. Item H, 2616 South Robinson Avenue, the owner is secured. Item I, 13408 Thompson Road, the owner is secured. Item K, 1900 Northwest 10th Street, the owner is secured. Item L, 1948 Northwest 15th Street, the owner is secured. Item O, 1219 Northwest 23rd Street, the owner is secured. Item S, 70, 747 Southeast 33rd Street, the owner is secured. Item W, 2656 Southwest 38th Street, to, to re-notify the owner. Item X, 2117. Southwest 47th Street, the owner is secured. Item AB, 923 Northwest 4th Street, the owner is secured. Item AC, 7801 Northwest 94th Street, the owner is secured. Under 9AJA1, page 19, item A, 5521 Dimple Drive, the owner is secured. Item B, 1213 North Indiana Avenue, the owner is secured. Item C, 3124 North May Avenue, the owner is secured. Item D, 2616 South Robinson Avenue, the owner is secured. Item E, 13408 Thompson Road, the owner is secured. Item G, 1948 Northwest 15th Street, the owner is secured. Item I, 1219 Northwest 23rd Street, the owner is secured. Item L, 747 Southeast 33rd Street, the owner is secured. Item O, 2656 Southwest 38th Street, to re-notify item P, 2117 Southwest 47th Street, the owner is secured, and item U, 7801 Northwest 94th Street, the owner is secured. All right, thank you very much. Okay, back to page two of your printed agenda. Now, item six, revocable permits. We have item 6A, a revocable permit with infant crisis services for the Baby Steps 5K and Trail Run. I don't have any, oh, wait, how we do we have someone who signed up to speak? Danielle Smith, is Danielle on the line? We're not seeing Danielle. I don't see her. Oh, hello. Feel free to go ahead and state your name and address and tell us a little bit about your event. I don't, I don't think she's there. Oh, that wasn't her? Okay. All right, go ahead, Councilman Stunsifer, if you want to take it. Sure, thank you very much. Um, for those of you that don't know much about in Infant Crisis Services, it's, uh, it's the only hunger relief agency in central Oklahoma that's dedicated exclusively to helping uh, infants and toddlers. It's been around since 1984, and during that period of time, it has offered and served uh, more than 3,000 uh, babies and toddlers in, in central Oklahoma. I am so excited uh, uh, as we move forward to now having revocable permit events. This will be a great event at Bluff Creek Park. If you haven't experienced Bluff Creek Park, it has one of the best trails, a 3.4 mile trail uh, in Oklahoma City, which is used for hiking, walking, running, and especially mountain biking. So I look forward to this event. I'm excited about this event and I would move for its approval. Second.
All right, looks like we can make motions. So we will try to do this now on PrimeGov. All right, cast your votes. Uh, Councilman McAtee and Councilman Stonecipher, I'm told we're waiting on your votes. Are you able to access PrimeGov? I, I, I have PrimeGov. It shows who made the motions, but I don't have the ability to vote, so I will vote yes. Okay, I like and, my who vote yes. Okay. All right, we've got two yeses there, and motion carries unanimously. All right, now before we recess council meeting, I'm going to do as I often do and pull up um the item related to the mask ordinance that allows our public health officials to get on to the task of fighting this pandemic we don't want to hold them all day and so as has been the custom i'm pulling up item 11a this is an ordinance to be introduced and adopted with emergency amending chapter 23 entitled health and sanitation uh extending uh, so so on so on we'll let councilman stone cipher uh, describe this. He's the primary author. He is joined in his uh, co-authorship here by Councilman Greiner, Councilman McAtee, Councilman Stone. Councilman Stone, sorry, for the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Um, I, I think the one thing that I really want to do uh, first and foremost is to hear from uh, Phil May Tubby, uh, uh, Dr. Gary Raskov, and Dr. Uh, Patrick McGaw. Uh, just for people that don't know about this, uh, Todd and I, uh, dating back to uh, uh, a week ago from this past Friday, uh, started having some conversations uh, with City County Health. And the one thing that uh, came crystal clear from the data that was provided to us is that we were about to realize a, a less than 5% positive, positive testing rating for over a two week period. And the cases had dropped down to uh, 10 cases per 100,000. In our conversations with Phil uh, May Tubby, uh, he suggested that the beginning point for that was either the 16th or 17th of March, and that a two-week period would run at either March 30th or March 31st. And um, the one thing that I think Todd and I have always said is that uh, this should begin with science and it should end with science. And, and we have been quite adamant about that. The other footnote that I would add to that is, I think it should also, we should also take into consideration what the United States Supreme Court has told us we can and we can't do uh, when infringing upon uh, individual liberties uh, for public safety. And uh, what, what the Supreme Court teaches us that any intrusion into in individual liberties, any regulation should be minimal uh, at best. Uh, it, should, it should not extend beyond uh, a lengthy period of time and it should not definitely not be indefinite. And so uh, we had Thank several conversations with, with, Matt, with Phil May Tubby. Uh, at first, he suggested either March 30th or 31st. Uh, then he got to looking at some spring break numbers, which suggested maybe April 3rd was a more appropriate date. Uh, and then we received uh, some correspondence uh, from City County Health on last uh, Thursday or Friday where city county health had saw some some spikes in in the numbers uh, that led to many more conversations emails and text uh, including the mayor and as a result of that the mayor sent out a request to city county health uh, to weigh in on this i think the discussions have been great i think they've been a good thing i think they've been positive for our community i've received emails texts letters uh, one person delivered me books on the subject matter. And so I think all this discussion is healthy for what's happening locally to us. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil uh, and, uh, and Gary and Patrick. I think Phil's going to lead off. But uh, uh, I'd like to hear Phil's perspective on what we've gone through the last couple of weeks and, and, and where, we're, where City County feels like we're at right now. Thank you, uh, Councilman Stonecipher. We greatly appreciate uh, being invited today. We want to say thanks also to uh, the entire council and to Mayor Holt. Um, 
before we uh, get things kicked off this morning with Bill doing a presentation, I did want to point out that in the room with me, I have my COO, Bill Maytubby. We have our board chair, Dr. Gary Raskov, and we have our chief of governmental affairs, LT Knighton. And uh, we all appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. And before we continue further, we also wanted to say thank you to both uh, Councilman uh, McAtee and Greiner and to congratulate them. And we greatly appreciate uh, Councilman McAtee for wearing our OCCHD mask today. We greatly appreciate that. Um, so with that, I would like to say that Bill will make a brief presentation uh, related to this. And we agree that the engagements and communications with members of council, mayor and others invested in this have been profitable for everyone. So thank you for that, Councilman Stonecipher. And with that, uh, Bill Maytubby will take it away. Bill, Bill, before you get started, one thing, could you emphasize and explain to people um, what it means by realizing less than a 5% positive testing rate and what it means when uh, cases, 10 cases per 100,000? Sure, so on the 5% positive testing rate, that means of all the people that test, that 5% or less of them are testing positive for COVID-19. But I wanted, and well, I'll go ahead and talk about that, but then the case rate is the same. The case rate is less than 10 per 100,000 for our population. So both of those are metrics I know that we started with, but I, I wanted to preface this just a little bit. When we made these initial metrics going forward, we didn't have any information about variants and we knew nothing about vaccine at the time. So uh, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll actually capture that more as we move forward into the presentation. Yeah, I think that's an important, I think that's an important point. It is. Go ahead, LT. So this one here's our daily case rate per 100,000 on the moving seven day moving average. And you can see we have been fairly flat for uh, since about mid-March until uh, last Friday, we had a little bit of a, a case rise. We'll have to look at today. Uh, the weekends sometimes are a little bit problematic because testing rates go down and it's, it's not accurate. And it's an, it's an issue that we have in general. So, when we talk about daily case rate per 100,000, seven day moving average, that is a rate related item, which means it is dependent on testing. Our testing is down 75%. So if our testing rates had stayed up where they need to be, and, this, and we still had this rate, we might be having a little different discussion. So uh, next slide, LT. So this is the testing and positivity rate. As you can see, the weekly average testing rate is in red. And the, the uh, others, hold on, that's over my, my language. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the positivity rate is in blue. So again, same, same issue that we have here. When our testing rates, you see how it kind of coincided earlier, earlier on where we had uh, our case rate and our uh, positivity rate were kind of matching up there in that 1111 11 range. And actually it pretty much mirrored if you looked at that overall, it's a pretty good match. So right now our issue is, is our testing is so low. We don't know if we have an accurate reflection of what's going on in Oklahoma. And just to, to uh, add to that, we have a 10% uh, across the board nationally, a rise in case rates nationally. We have case rates rising in 30 states. So we don't have uh, uh, castle walls or anything around the borders of Oklahoma. So we know that, you know, eventually we are going to have some issues here. This is one of the reasons that we're a little bit apprehensive of pulling the plug a little bit too early. Next slide, LT. So this is our current hospitalizations. And as you can see, the hospitalizations have remained fairly flat. We are in the green range as far as the ability of our hospitals to handle it, but that rate is still too high. Uh, that's not something we wanna to have to deal with on a regular basis, uh, over a hundred cases of COVID patients in the hospitals. 
So that tells us that yes, it is much better, but it's still not where it needs to be. Next slide, LT. So this is the discussion on variants. So these are the variants, the ones that you see up here on top, the P1, which is Brazil, the B117, which is the Great Britain, the B1351, which is the South African, and the others are just other variants that have developed that are uh, more prolific with the ability to spread. So those are things that we have already tested for and have found here in Oklahoma. <clears throat> That's clinical testing. And then we also wanted to talk Actually, I've given you the, the site to go look that data up if you want to look it up. And then on the sewage surveillance, which is our early warning system here in Oklahoma City, realize that uh, not everybody has this. So it's, it's, it's quite a, a thing for us to have because it is predictive seven days in advance and it does give us, us the ability to do wide scale testing for variants. So we have already seen some of the genomes that are related to these uh, specific variants that would cause us issues in our sewage surveillance. So that gives us a little bit of pause because some of these variants either spread more rapidly or they uh, have lower efficacy, efficacy to uh, vaccine. Uh, also, some, it affects some of the treatment courses for the, for the ill patients. So our sewage levels are still high enough to indicate significant community tr transmission that is not reflected in the reported case numbers. Again, uh, re that relies on the, on the quantity and amount of testing that we do. So we're still on a slightly upward trend on that, which should pan out up here uh, within about the next two to three days. And we expect to see some higher numbers. Uh, Dr. Rascott, is there anything you want to add? No, Phil, so that, that captures it very well. Just. Uh, Regarding the B117 variant, as we said in the letter, the two uh, studies came out in the last two weeks only, which showed that it is both considerably more infectious, more highly transmissible, and uh, more lethal, with about a 60% higher mortality for people who contract the B117 COVID than for the, uh, the, the wild type regular COVID we've been dealing with over the last year. So um, uh, that's just an added uh, importance of us monitoring uh, the progress of these. Okay, uh, next slide, LT. I can jump in here for a second. Sure. Bill? Yeah, I, I think it, it all kinds of, kind of runs together, but uh, I know Todd and I uh, talked to Phil on Saturday. Uh, we talked to Gary on Sunday, uh, we talked to Patrick, I think on Monday, and uh, these were good, productive, healthy conversations. And, um, and the collaboration between the city and city county health has been incredible in my mind. We've worked well together, we've communicated well. Um, I think I spent more time this weekend with uh, Phil and Gary than I did my wife. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, but the point is, and I'm being serious here, is um, the United States Supreme Court says that a regulation uh, must, must be reasonable in length. It can't exceed that, uh, when you're, even if you're talking about public safety. And so I think the productive thing that, and Todd, you chime in, and, and if you disagree with me, that's okay. I think the pro productive thing that came about as a result of these conversations uh, was the last sentence in the letter uh, the last paragraph that was uh, written by uh, Gary and Patrick, and that is um, that they are willing to be guided by the science, and they're willing to come back to us uh, in two weeks for our next council meeting and tell us where we are scientifically. Did I say that correctly, guys? Yes, sir. Uh, just real quickly to ask one question. I, I saw on the news this morning that um, and I, I believe it may have been attributed to you, Gary, that you really weren't interested in seeing the mask mandate leave until we reached herd immunity. Is that correct or incorrect? No, I mean, that's one parameter. I think uh, uh, herd immunity is important. Um, and, um, you know, we can, we can get there. Um, I think as we outlined in the letter, we're also particularly 
uh, emphasizing the 65 plus population where we're doing an excellent job of getting high levels of vaccination because that's the group where most harm would occur. Um, and then we wanna track the variants. Uh, we'll learn a bit more, I think very quickly about the effectiveness of the vaccine against the variants. It doesn't go to zero, but it might be moderately less effective. But I think it's, uh, as Councilman Stonecipher said, we're looking at these metrics, the positivity rate in, in light of the testing rate, um, how many cases we're having, hospitalization, and buying us time with the masks to get us to close to herd immunity and to really protect the most vulnerable people, which is the 65 plus. So Mayor? just to be clear, I'm not anti-mask and, and no matter how this thing ends up, I certainly hope that everyone continues to wear a mask. Um, let me ask you this question. The infection rate of people 65 and older, do we know what percentage that was? Oh, recently it's dropped off dramatically due to vaccines, but we don't no, have- I'm saying like overall in our population, what percentage of people 65 and older do we think that, that actually had COVID? Well, that was a point in time. I mean, it changed every week. But at one point, I know our infection rate was probably close to 50% for the over 65 population. Now, that was early I, just, on. I was thinking more cumulative number-wise. Okay. Like, well, we what percentage? I'd have, to, I'd have to do some research on that. Okay. I was just curious. The, and then the next question that I'd like some insight on is um, people getting the vaccine that have already had COVID. What, what are the guidelines on that? So right now, if you've already had COVID, the guidance now is that you just can't be, uh, you can't be ill. So you need to have gone all the way through the virus and be back to normal. You don't need to wait 90 days anymore. You can get it immediately after you recover. Right, unless you require quarantine, you can receive the vaccine uh, and that's where it is. And that's a change, you know, early on, it was about a 90 day period out from uh, no longer having symptoms and then you could receive the vaccine, but that's a much shorter time now, Councilman. Right. Councilman, we, we know that the antibodies created when you are infected with COVID last for at least about six months. What we don't know is whether the immunity conferred by that is as strong as what you receive when you get a vaccine, correct? Which is uh, very striking in its in its production of, of immunity, both antibodies and cell immunity. And as you know from the literature and the, the trials, show very high efficacy rates for the Pfizer and Moderna products, and and the, the Johnson and Johnson product has a very high rate against protecting people from hospitalization and death, which are really the outcomes we're wanting to focus on. So it's probable that the immunity you get from vaccination is stronger than what you get from just natural infection, correct? I'm glad you brought one more that. question. One more question. Uh, this one came up, and I thought it was very interesting. If you've already had COVID with very minimal results, um, where should you be at in line in terms of getting a vaccine? As early as you can get the vaccine, every person needs to get the vaccine. You know, now we're basically in phase four and everyone's had a thorough opportunity. We've tried to make it available over and over again to the most vulnerable groups. And at this point, uh, we're encouraging everyone get the vaccine at their earliest possible time. Uh, whether that's from a local pharmacy or from us at the city county health department or a local you know hospital it it really doesn't matter we're just encouraging vaccine all the way around and even though they've already had it and recovered uh, the potential to get a worse case uh, later is very high so we don't want people uh, risking that by waiting on others at this point also i'm glad you brought that up because that that, that clarifies another reason for people to get vaccinated some of these variants, you uh, you don't. If you've had a normal infection from here uh, in Oklahoma, and we get one of these other variants like the P three five one or the 
B1351 or the P1, you may not have protection and you're much more likely to be reinfected, but the vaccine will at least give you some protection. And Councilman Stone, what also I'd like to say is that Bill can get with our epidemiology group and we'll look and see if we can not bring you that cumulative total at our next meeting, if that's possible with the data that's available to us. But if there's any way that we can get our hands on that, we'll bring that to you. Thank you. The, uh, and I appreciate so much all of y'all's help through this past year, uh, even this past weekend. I know we drug you guys away from a lot of what you wanted to do, but really appreciate the discussion, appreciate your time, um, and appreciate all your hard work on this issue. It's, I just kind of want to be remindful that what we're discussing here isn't the wearing of the masks, it's whether it's the, the mandating by the city of wearing the mask. Um, do we still expect that Midwest City is going to drop theirs this week? That it will sunset? We have no idea of predicting that. Yeah, and we really are trying to okay. stay from talking about what the other councils are doing because it really, you know, it's once that they have their meetings, it, it, we really can't predict. But I, you know, it's not, we know that others are falling away from the mask and we're not trying to deny that. We just hate to speak on another council's behalf when they haven't really given us permission to do that. Okay. I was under the assumption that they had a trigger in theirs based on the uh, positivity rate. They do. And as, uh, as Phil was outlining, I mean, they have that kind of, it sounding like uh, that something may be attached to that uh, percentage of positivity, but there's so many other factors to be considered as both Dr. Raskob and Bill have already explained. It sometimes should, you know, other items should be looked at, not just a single item. And especially when we were first setting all of those metrics and things, uh, we weren't aware of what the vaccine was going to actually entail. And, you know, uh, the thing with science, it progresses as you go. This was new to everyone, just like we're all still grappling with so many issues from it. And so uh, we did the best we could early on and we will continue to do that. But now we know that we need to take a look at a couple of other things before we just, you know, say this is not necessary. And thank you for pointing out because it is true that whether there's a mask ordinance or mandate or whatever that someone wants to call it going forward, the health department will still recommend and make, you know, and try to get uh, education to the public about what is in their best interest. And so regardless of whether uh, in two weeks or three weeks or whenever, uh, that something may change legally, we will still be putting forth our recommendations with or without a mandate. That is correct. And Councilman, yeah. I think I wanted to clarify, I think this is important and maybe um, we didn't communicate this as well as we could have at the beginning regarding the positivity rate and uh, apologize if that's the case, but the positivity rate as Phil outlined has to be interpreted in the context of the testing rate and you saw that the testing rate mirrored the positivity rate very significantly these last few weeks, such that we are testing very few people now. Probably people are, people are getting vaccinated, other people are just not going in for testing. So had the testing rate stayed the same and the positivity rate went way down, we would have had much greater confidence that we're suppressing the, the transmission of the virus in the community. Correct. Um, and so we want, to, we want to do a good job. We want to, we'd like to still encourage people to get tested if they need to but i think that maybe at the beginning when we talked about metrics we maybe didn't make that as clear as we should have in terms of the interrelationship between testing rate and positivity rate and uh, i wanted to just uh, you know, take responsibility for that and i wanted to point out just briefly because there's one more slide that i'd like phil to go over with us in just a moment but also just uh, what a phenomenal opportunity and that we're leading in the nation and that we're able to look at our sewage and get that predictive model that we've discussed. So that's something that you know Oklahoma City should really be very proud of. We've talked to this group about it before, I believe, and it's made the news and those kinds of things. But when testing is dropping down, the predictive model of the sewage is so important because it's showing us ahead of time where the peaks are going to go. So we're really, really fortunate and blessed that our city and 
OU and all the other partners that have been involved in this. It's been very helpful to our public health department and to uh, just a conversation such as this to know this is happening or this variant is present and things like that, that other people maybe aren't as fortunate, especially when we're not testing uh, the way that we could be. So uh, that's an important piece. And but if you don't mind, uh, if everyone's okay with it, I'd like Bill to just talk one more minute about the vaccinations that we've done uh, so that you can, that's part of the picture, I think that's important in this process. And if we can get folks vaccinated, then the masking piece, uh, you know, it, it has direct bearing on how long we need the mask. So here you can see our vaccine distribution, not only in the state, but for Oklahoma County, so we, we've given a lot, we've done a good job here in Oklahoma of getting the vaccine out. That's gonna really benefit us moving forward. So one of the key points that Dr. Raskov brought up was in Oklahoma County, we have just a little over 50% of our residents over 65 that have received both doses of the vaccine. We need to get that up a little bit because if we get a spike up, that is the group that's most likely to end up in the hospital. 34% mm -hmm. of our, 34.7% of our county residents have received a prime dose. And that number is climbing drastically every day. So, and then the 18.5% of our residents in Oklahoma County are completely vaccinated. So one of the things that we want to bring up is, guys, we're not that far out. We're, we're really not. We just need to get a, little, a few more vaccines under our belt and we need to monitor. We haven't even been able to monitor to see if we're if we're going to have much of an impact from spring break yet, so that would be uh, another reason for us to possibly de delay right now and for us to start looking at this on a more regular basis with the council. So, Councilman Stonecipher, that concludes our presentation. Unless you have further questions, Mark, this is Councilman McAtee. I'd like to make a comment, if I could. Uh, I happen to be a member of the Over 65 Club. I'm 84 years old. And so I think that I am wise enough to analyze the facts, the data that's there, and to make a decision on whether I want to mask or not to mask. And everything I hear is, is positive uh, as far as what's going on, but you still are not allowing you and I to make that decision because what I understand is still mandatory masking that's on the table. I think it should not be mandatory it should be up to the individual to make his or her own decision. Thank you all. So are that, do you have any guidelines maybe for us that, I mean, I know one thing I've been asking about since we started was what, what are the numbers that we're trying to head to uh, that it's not a mandate? And I'm not saying remove all masks from everybody. I'm saying, what are those numbers when it's not a mandate? This morning I heard it was herd immunity, but I don't even know what that number is. You guys have any maybe clarification on that or yeah. thoughts? As, as a start, I'm asking it's not absolutely rigid. So, but we want to get close to 70% of people vaccinated. We want a very high number of the 65 plus vaccinated. I think you'll be very encouraged when we show you data in two weeks of the progress in that group. And we want this positivity rate to stay where it is that that goes with with it and the case counts. So, um, you know, uh, those are generally the parameters. That's what we outlined in the letter. Um, this is David Greenwell. Can I ask a question concerning the percentage of vaccination? I'm surprised that the population over 65 is just at 50% at this point. I would like to see that higher at this stage. And can you give us a projection as to what you think the percentages may be by the end of April for both those above 65, as well as the just all adults? Yeah, sure. So that was a good question. So, you know, we said 50% of our population is double vaccinated, which means they're completely covered. We already have another 38% that have one dose. So very, very close. 
And we Bill, just need to get them vaccinated. And in particular, the 65 plus group, we've got greater than 50%, and then we've got about 38% of them having their uh, a first dose only. Correct. So when that group completes their second dose, see how much higher we'll be. We just need time to get that done. Well, and, and, and to your your question, Councilman, the timing is so, so you get a first dose of vaccine, you get some protection about two weeks later. The second dose of vaccine is either three or four weeks after your first, right? And then two weeks after the second dose is when you anticipate full protection from the vaccine. So that gives you a feel for what we face over the next few weeks. As Bill mentioned, in addition to the 50% that are fully vaccinated now, two weeks from now, they'll be fully protected. Another 30 some odd percent have gotten their first dose. Many of those will have received their second dose in the next two weeks, right, Phil? That's correct. And, and so, as you said, by the end of April, we'll be, I, we're very confident that 65 plus population will be at a very high rate of full protection with vaccine. Yes, and Phil, so that you correct me, do you know what yesterday's was on the first dose for the 65 plus, what percentage is 30 something? 38. 30, that's what I said, but I wasn't, okay, thank you. Okay, that's encouraging. One other question, on your very first slide, you show a steep decline in the number of cases beginning about in January sometime, it started to decline. Can you speculate as to uh, the reasons other than the vaccination that contributed to the decline? I mean, it's rather steep. It's almost, we're getting out of this almost as quickly as we got into it from some respects. Sure, I, I can take that or Dr. Rashi, I can take it. So that is a combination of both vaccination and people who have already had COVID. So that's another protection for our uh, population. It's both through vaccine and through local infection. So, you know, these numbers that we're looking for, to say it's, it looks like it's a good time for us to, to recommend, we're, we're not that far away. That's why we're just saying people just need to have just a little bit of patience because we really just need to monitor for bumps right now and get more vaccination under our belt and it's gonna be sooner rather than later. And Phil, Phil I would just add though, um, uh, to the reasons, it might also be that as those case spikes occurred and the news was reporting hospitals full and ICU beds minimal, it's, you know, we don't know, but it's likely that people modified their behavior a bit as well. And okay. those surges reflect uh, holiday gatherings and other things uh, to a certain extent. And if you look at this chart, if LT, if you'll leave it up there just a moment. So we began vaccinating 12, 14 of 20. And so uh, right after that, you and you begin to see that. And I do think that when the mayor and other leaders call for the public to be cautious and all those kinds of things, it, it, we do see impact from that, we believe. And also then people kind of stop some of, they, they modify their behaviors, but they wear a mask. They kind of, uh, for a moment, for a week or two, you know, they'll back off on all the public gathering and things like that that they're doing uh, when they are alerted that things are rising. And so I agree with Dr. Raskov. And I also think, uh, you know, a month out is definitely time from when you start vaccinating to see the difference that it's making, not only in preventing those people from getting it, but then in turn spreading it. So when you're stopping someone from receiving it and you're stopping them from uh, spreading it both, uh, then it really, you'll begin to see a decline. So you really see a drastic decline one month later. Yeah, okay, thank you. Here's this Mark Stone Cypher, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So when this, this process all started, I didn't know Phil. I didn't know Gary. I'd met Patrick once. And uh, through all of our conversations of late, um, I truly believe they are trying to do the right thing. And based upon their request of me, um, I would make a motion at this time uh, to defer this for two weeks until our next council meeting. Okay, we have a motion for a deferral. Um, we 
do have, I, I, I suppose I should handle the residents who signed up to speak before we proceed on the motion. So let's hold that thought. And we don't have a ton. We've only had four who signed up, so it shouldn't take too long. Uh, why don't we handle that? And then we'll return to this motion. Um, let's see, uh, Lou, Louise Brooke. Hello? Yes, Louise. Yes, it's me. Yes, go, go ahead. All right, my name is Lou Brooke. I live at 2257 Northwest 36th Street. Um, I'll start by saying, um, we told you so. And even I told you so. Uh, you didn't listen to us and people died. If you don't remember, because some of you don't bother to stay for citizens to be heard, I'll remind you. For example, in November, I thanked you for continually passing the mask mandate. I implored you to do more or our health infrastructure wouldn't be able to handle the onslaught and that being disabled made me disproportionately affected. So what is it that happened? The council basically did only the one thing, which was continually pass the ma mask mandate. And now you're talking about undoing that. And COVID spread. It was slowed by masks, but people died of COVID. On top of that, we got to hear reports of things like the ambulances are delayed because there isn't anyone at the hospital to take the patients when they try to drop them off. Do you all feel responsible for the people that die waiting for an ambulance? Do you? I hold you all responsible for their deaths and more. You were all in a position to prevent our health systems from failing and you decided a mask mandate was sufficient when it hasn't been adequate at all. Now with B117, B1351, P1 or worse on the rise locally, are y'all really about to tell me we should rescind rather than extend our mask mandate? When even more people die, the ones you kill with your decisions or lack thereof, I am not going to forget. Before the mask mandate was passed, I was disabled and unvaccinated and I didn't go into any stores for months. Some, had, some stores had required masks, but the compliance was really crappy until the city passed a mask mandate. There are disabled people that need a mask to go to the grocery store, to go to the doctor, and even yes, to get the vaccine. They don't need to be wearing a mask, they need us to be wearing a mask. You really don't care about disabled people. You only ever talk about 65 plus. How many medically vulnerable people are currently vaccinated? I have no idea. Stating that you want to end the mask mandate early tells all of us exactly how much you value our lives, which is you don't. Obviously extend the mask mandate, but also consider other non-pharmaceutical interventions to combat the next wave of this pandemic. I don't want us all to be back here in several months saying people died, we told you so, as it's not really very fun for any of us. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole McAfee. Is Nicole there? Hi. Hi, go ahead. Did we lose her? Nicole? No, she's still there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Nicole McAfee. I live in Ward 6. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm 31 years old and I'm at high risk for COVID. Uh, when I was a, a kid in high school, a freshman, I suffered from really severe asthma. Um, I had another round of severe bronchitis that my doctor was afraid was becoming pneumonia and I was hospitalized. While in the hospital, an asymptomatic carrier gave me pertussis or whooping cough, a disease that for a long time we hadn't had to worry about, but a trend in not being vaccinated caused a rise again. I have lifelong lung trouble from that bout of pertussis. COVID could be really damaging to my health. And so that means for the last year plus, I have stayed inside my home. I haven't gotten to hug my grandparents or my parents. Um, my sister is pregnant and about to have a baby in April, and I don't know when I'll get to see my niece, um, when it will be safe for me or anyone. I can't begin to describe how upsetting it is to know that my public elected officials are spending their time thinking about ways to make us less safe in order to make things more convenient for people who don't care about my health and well-being. I urge you not only to not 
end this mask mandate early, but to instead focus your time and energy on ways that you can continue to center our collective public health. I think the last speaker was very right in naming that you only focus on vulnerability based on age. And while folks 65 plus should certainly be centered in, in our discussions of health and well-being, there are so many more of us who are at risk and we matter too. I want to be in a place where masks don't have to be mandated where folks have the basic decency to show up and care about their fellow citizens, but that has not been what Oklahoma City has done. And so I hope that today you will not only put off this decision for another two weeks, but at least until the end of April, and that in the meantime, you will do everything seconds, possible three. to show up for all of us who are vulnerable and counting on you. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsten Willoughby. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good morning. If you wouldn't mind stating your name and address and keep your remarks to three minutes or less. Thank you. Absolutely. My name is Kirsten Willoughby. Uh, my address is 5101 Northwest 164th Terrace. I am in Ward 8. Um, and I am here to um, oppose this, uh, you know, this item. Um, my representative is Mark Stonecipher, and he has said uh, repeatedly that, you know, we start, we started with science and we are trying to end with science. Um, however, it's, it's resoundingly clear that medical experts from the health department, the Center for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization um, have provided research-based data showing that masks, you know, greatly help reduce transmission of coronavirus. Uh, in addition, with the increasing number of COVID variants popping up in our surrounding states um, and the limited number of our state's most vulnerable receiving vaccinations, I think it's important to keep a mask mandate uh, until we are in a more safe window. Um, in addition, I've also seen some commentary from some of the council members regarding um, the mental health of people, quote unquote, forced to wear masks. However, um, you know, me as a citizen who is completely fine wearing a mask in any situation, um, I've seen many people that do not want to wear masks simply choose not to wear them. So a mask mandate is not infringing on anyone's freedom because it's not enforced and the people that don't want to wear the masks aren't. What a mask mandate does do uh, is give business owners and customers like myself, uh, you know, the ability to feel at least a little bit protected when a business wants to require masks for entry. Um, and also I have seen some commentary regarding uh, mask mandates hindering economic development. Uh, and I have yet to see any research-based data that shows uh, that a mask mandate hinders economic development in any form. Um, I do hope that the, uh, the council will oppose this rather than just defer it because two weeks from now, um, I suspect post many spring breaks and with the increasing number of uh, variants popping up around us that our numbers will continue to increase. And just because our hospitals are green now does not, mean, uh, does not mean that the healthcare workers should continue to be put in uh, this situation. So I want to say that I appreciate all the council members um, for working so hard on this, uh, but I hope that you choose to oppose this rather than defer it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Nick Brook. Nick there. Uh, star six to unmute, Nick. Okay. Well, we could try uh, Joel Dixon. Uh, 
Good morning. My name is Joel Dixon. I'm at 1020 Northwest 34th Street. I, uh, I've heard a lot of discussion this morning about um, our rights, uh, being able to make choices for ourselves, etc. And, and lots of talk about what we can and cannot do, you know, as a society, as a city, etc. And um, you know, we have, a, a, I guess, some rights and some obligations as a society to, to determine what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, it strikes me that a lot of people like to point out that um, having people wear masks in public is, is some sort of heavy burden, uh, some imposition against uh, individual rights to, to conduct themselves in ways that they think are appropriate and that they see fit. Uh, I just want to point out that if you think masks are a massive um, infringement on your individual rights, uh, wait till you hear about society's requirements for you to wear pants when you're out in public. Um, lots of uh, scientists, medical personnel, economists um, have pointed out that had we just done the right thing from the beginning. Uh, if a year ago, instead of uh, all of this uh, frustration and anger at having to wear a small piece of cloth over our faces, we would have just been responsible human beings, looked out for one another, uh, cared for our fellow man in the Christian ideal and put masks on, we would not have had to shut down our economy. We would not have had to um, close our businesses and, and experience the social, uh, the commercial, the economic impacts. Um, it's a very, very small ask, uh, much like wearing pants in public to put on a mask for the care uh, and consideration of our fellow citizens. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, and I thank you all for your time this morning. Thank you. Uh, I'll give one last chance before we close public comment. Nick Brook. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Uh, sorry about the trouble, Mayor. Uh, thank sure. you, uh, Council. Uh, I just, uh, actually, I don't really need to repeat very much of what the previous commenter said. The only thing I would just point out is that uh, a lot of this rigmarole could have been avoided had uh, our council people contacted the health department and asked them what they thought about the mask mandate before putting out a press release about appealing it. Um, you know, we're in phase four in Oklahoma uh, on the vaccine plan, and I know that people like to build that as a great thing, uh, but what that really should tell you is that there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in Oklahoma. Uh, if everyone in the uh, more vulnerable groups were receiving the vaccine when it was offered, we wouldn't be able to offer it to everyone so quickly. Uh, so what drives that? Why are people hesitant to get a vaccine? Uh, well, part of it is that they see their elected leaders uh, arguing about basic scientific facts uh, and that ordinances like this one, uh, proposals like this one, to roll back the mask mandate uh, are taken seriously. Uh, no reasonable scientific minded person thinks that repealing the mask mandate is a good idea right now. Uh, it's extremely dangerous. It's obviously dangerous. And uh, it doesn't even take that long to explain why. Uh, I, I'm confident that had the council members reached out to the county health department uh, quietly uh, before they made this quite silly proposal, uh, they would have been happy to explain to them uh, the myriad reasons uh, why we need to keep this mandate in place. Uh, I would encourage uh, all of you uh, to look at what's happening in the uh, more coastal metro areas in the United States, places like uh, New York and Florida, also, even uh, Michigan, Detroit, uh, with a lot of travel, is having a very serious outbreak right now. And uh, that can be Oklahoma. Uh, and it will be Oklahoma if we continue to behave the way that we have. 
Uh, we live in a state without a statewide mask mandate. That's crazy. Uh, that's not the council's fault. Uh, I appreciate that the council has stepped up and uh, put this mandate in place. It made a significant impact. Uh, in July and August, we had uh, months of, uh, that of disease suppression. Uh, the, count the counts went down before the school- You have 30 started. seconds. And so uh, the mask mandates helped uh, and they continue to help. Uh, I appreciate the council for rolling them out, but I would just encourage us to get behind our public health professionals uh, and uh, have a united public uh, pro-science stance against this very deadly illness. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. And now we are back on the motion. Uh, Councilman Stensifer had made a motion for deferral. And I suppose we can handle that um, on the prime gun. Mayor? Yes. May I ask our health officials a quick couple questions? Okay, sure. Thank you. I just wanted to hear from our residents first. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at some of the, I'm looking at the New York Times, for instance, um, and on their front page, it says when the US population might be vaccinated and this 65, 70% number you all are um, focusing on right now uh, in terms of herd immunity, it looks like it says the current pace, if we are vaccinating at the uh, current pace, we would uh, see the US population reach 70% vaccination around June 16th and 90% around July 24th. That 70% number is standing out to me. I think my follow-up, well, I have two questions related to that. First one is, do those numbers about, um, those kind of line up with what you're, you all are seeing? And then my follow-up to that is, you know, uh, we are a city, then there's the state, then there's the United States. And you, uh, I'm just curious, knowing, you know, interstate commerce exists, um, knowing also that even though um, the CDC is saying travel is not something for us to do right now, folk are, some folk are doing that. What does it realistically look like, or do we? Is it is it just at the local and county level that we need to hit that seventy percent before we start talking about um, undoing our mask ordinance, or is this actually a conversation about our United States reaching that? And I don't. That's not. I don't know that answer. I'm genuinely asking. So thank you. For um, excellent, excellent questions and observations. And what I would like to say is it would be awesome if the entire United States could be in agreement and we could all get there at the same time. Um, you make a good point in differentiating our city and our county from the rest of the nation as well. We are leading the nation, as you may have known, in our county and in our state in vaccine uptake. And so we would actually reach for our area, a herd, we're on target to reach a herd immunity sooner than other places like you listed across the United States. Uh, but collectively as a nation, uh, certainly that should be brought into the picture and you should look at what we're seeing across our nation as a whole. That is a very, very valid point. But here in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County, to your other point is we are leading. And so we, our population as it sits by itself without people flying in and out, and that's a good point that you made, uh, we will be at herd immunity much sooner. Uh, but the nice thing about herd immunity is that even if someone were to fly into our city or our county from somewhere else and they're infected, then it's less likely that it's going to take off and spread because of the fact that our population is so vaccinated or that we've had such a significant amount of our population has already had the virus. So uh, that's the important thing. Herd immunity uh, matters collectively, but it also does matter in pockets. So uh, I hope that answers your question. And Dr. Reskov and Phil may have additional information, but brilliant questions. Thank you. Nothing to add. So I know where, I know where uh, Councilman Cooper was going. So you have basic herd immunity and you have community level herd immunity. That's what we're seeking right now is for our community. 
here in Oklahoma County and Oklahoma City to reach that community level of herd immunity. Because once we have that, we do have a level of protection uh, from the things that Dr. McGough specifically mentioned. So really keeping, thank you for that clarification. That's actually very helpful. So really our county reaching that, that percentage is really critical to protect us from the variants and the uh, initial iteration of COVID. Um, so that, uh, that's, that's very helpful to hear. Um, follow up. Um, I'm to understand the vaccination phase four began yesterday in earnest. Um, just one more time, if you could just walk us through the steps then for someone, I let's say I it opened yesterday, I got my vaccination yesterday. How long before I am a fully vaccinated individual who's able to contribute to that uh, county community herd immunity you all just described? In the simplest format, Councilman Cooper, it's uh, two weeks, just so that people don't miss a lot of days here and there, two weeks following the second dose, you are at your maximum protection. You, we wouldn't count you in that group of folks being protected until at least two weeks after a second dose. And depending on whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, it's, okay. I, so I take my, I got my, let's say I took my, uh, I got my vaccination yesterday. Um, depending on whether it was Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson, it will vary 21 or 28 days before I can receive the follow-up. Is that about right? Sir, yes, yes sir. sir. And then on the Johnson & Johnson, you know, that's a one and done situation. Yep. And, and we're using the Johnson & Johnson strategically for populations that may be hard to get back for a second dose or who may not and so on. So, you know, we're really, Phil is doing just a fantastic job in coordinating how this vaccine is dispersed for the maximum impact. Yes. Mm -hmm. So someone gets vaccinated yesterday, we're talking third, fourth week of April before, unless they got Johnson and Johnson, um, we're talking, third, fourth week of April before someone can receive their second dose, then two weeks from that second vaccination before they are really able to uh, contribute to um, us as uh, uh, communities and a county achieving that herd immunity. Am I hearing those that timeline about right? And please, you all are um, you know, I'm the English and film studies and philosophy teacher. You all are the science folk and health folk. Am I hearing that timeline about right? So your timing was actually pretty good. You know, you had you had a June date for hitting 70% herd immunity. Mm -hmm. That's right on our predictive model. So mid-June, we may be at herd immunity. We'll just have to continue to evaluate. Now, that assumption is without significant amounts of variance that, that come into you know our sphere of influence. So that's that's why we are still uh, trying to make sure that we protect you guys as well as we can from that because we're doing such a good job here. We are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We just want to make sure that we don't pull the trigger too quick. And we Phil, can speed that date up if we get more vaccine and deliver right. more vaccine. So Phil, is it right to say that that we're not at capacity for giving out our vaccine. We're limited by what supply we are given. Is that right? We are, but we're doing so much better now. Yeah. yeah. And Phil, I think if you would speak to Councilman's timeline also on, he was, uh, he was drawing the line from mm -hmm. first vaccination, when they could get their second one and the date out that it would be. If someone yesterday, when we went into phase four, sure. then when would they be able to have their next shot and then when would they be part of our? Uh, I think I think I can answer this pretty pretty briefly. So if everybody that was eligible to get vaccinated yesterday went and got vaccinated, you would have you would get your first vaccine 21 days later for Pfizer, 28 days days later for Moderna, and then you would wait that 10 days, and then everybody would be at max max protection at that point. So that sounds like, and again, if you're saying 28 days from 
from the 29th of March. Again, we're talking that could be the end of April for the Moderna, again, toward the end of April for Pfizer. And that's assuming, and this goes to your supply demand uh, notes just a few moments ago, that's assuming that the demand yesterday wasn't so high that everyone got, uh, they are, that it, not only did they sign up for to receive the vaccination, they got the vaccination yesterday. So that's, that's another variable. So at most rapid pace here, we're talking about two weeks into May. That, that's at a rapid pace, right? Following that 28 days from yesterday uh, to receive your second shot and then that 10 days uh, following your second vaccination. So again, we're talking about, can someone contribute to this herd immunity and the public safety of our folk? That's looking like about May 10th. And, and so now I understand, you know, at best May 10th-ish, and then now I understand even more at the United States level why we're talking about that June number. Thank you. James, for James, James, one thing I'd say that's another variable, and, and if I got this wrong, Patrick, but I, I think I heard either Phil or you say this, we have 38% of the people that are over 65 that have already had their first vaccination, right? That is correct. Yes. And we have people outside of that age range. Um, let me also just say then, um, I, I don't like that we're about to defer this. And I would actually ask us to not. I think we should just vote. And then and we already have our initial date of April 30th. And I want everyone to hear exactly what I'm saying. Don't just hear it, listen to it. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Hearing is we hear things, it's background noise. Listening is what I described earlier when I said that Councilman McAtee and I were on an hour to two hour call several months ago. If the timeline we just walked through with public health officials it holds, then we are talking that a significant number of our folk who just, if they received the uh, yesterday's vaccination, received it yesterday, meaning they will not be eligible to receive a follow-up required second dose until right around the time our mask ordinance is supposed to expire April 30th. And we also just heard that another 10 days are required after that second vaccination. So now we're talking a week or two into May. Why are we having a conversation then right now about revisiting this in two weeks? What all it's going to do is put us right back in this position again, where we are debating something that just today we settled the debate I, I, I and it's been settled for a while I, I, that's a genuine question that's not rhetorical why are we going to put mental health right now is something that is so heavy on my mind as a teacher so many of my students are struggling with mental health right now because of this pandemic and we're already struggling with mental health prior to this pandemic why would we put this back in front of the people two weeks from now and have to go through this again? And especially why would we bring our public health officials two weeks from now? We've been on this call for what, an hour or whatever time, time's a blur. Uh, why would we do that? They have work to do. Can we, can we just vote on this right now and, and see what happens? I do not wanna vote on a deferral one way or the other. Can we consider that? Let me and respond to that, James. Why. James, let me respond to yeah. that. And, and I think the important thing is, I agree with you on mental health. There are a lot of people that are wanting to see it, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I am getting numerous calls, numerous texts, numerous emails that don't just want us dictating what this policy should be. They want input from the professionals. And the professionals are saying, we will come back to you and talk to you in two weeks. We'll know more will be past spring break. And so I think it's important for us as counselors uh, to listen to what our people want. And I think a large segment of the population wants us to continue to have this debate. 
Well, I would have to disagree on a lot of folks wanting us to have this debate. And some of the reasoning for that is clearly, as we looked at the numbers that were presented, 18.5% uh, of our residents in Oklahoma County are currently vaccinated. 18.5. We haven't even got to half. We haven't even received vaccinations as far as the equity piece, which is something that is always at the forefront in my mind that we look at. And I would have hoped uh, for some of the council members that are also on uh, the, the ask of letting this mandate expire or the, uh, making sure we amend this uh, mandate that you would be considering that health equity aspect for your residents that uh, you represent as well. So when we're looking at those things and we're looking at the herd immunity for June, I'm also looking at the, the folks who called in to talk about being asymptomatic, comorbidity or multimorbidity. All of those things are so important for our communities. And the fact, again, as much as we're trying to, to shuffle this and, and thank you to the Oklahoma City County Health Department for uh, ensuring that we are working through the equity piece, but we still don't have a productive framework where folks can say, okay, I know for sure I can go here. I know for sure I can go here to get my vaccination, or I know for sure I can go here to get tested. We have been tagged all weekend. We have been uh, receiving phone calls to our offices. We have received emails and we all received that book. So again, when we're looking at what is happening in phase four beginning yesterday, now we get to shuffle in uh, the work. We just got over the spring break. And as we looked at even the numbers that came in yesterday, um, from our emergency management, let me explain. We our uh, cumulative cases are up 882 since the 26th of, of March. That's a lot of people for us to say we're on the downstroke of this. So I, I would really reconsider us doing this and I'm, I will not vote to defer this because this needs to be over um, and we need to just let this continue uh, through the end of April. And let me also say, when we ex decided to extend this mask mandate, and if I believe it was in December, uh, to March, uh, the initial date was to, to be March, there was a council member that said, let's extend it until April, the end of April, because of Easter, the Easter holiday coming up. So we have a lot of things coming. Uh, we're about to vote in one of our consent items for us to continue and work with OU as far as the sewage collection of this is concerned. So we need to keep working through this for our residents to feel safe. And I wanna thank all of those residents who reached out to me, uh, whether it be by phone, by email, even if, if it was my inbox on any of uh, the social media platforms because everyone cares about what's happening. Uh, we just found out about some residents that are in the city. One young lady was 92. She didn't want to get the vaccine. She just got it. So there is still a lot of hesitancy pertaining to how people in our communities are working through the process of receiving the vaccination uh, when it comes to COVID-19. We have a big pot that's coming uh, April 7th. That's going to be at the state fairgrounds where people will be able to get uh, one of the three. So we have things in place and we need to continue working through this before we decide we're done. So I will not be voting to defer this. And I would hope that we would continue again, even to have the updates. We need those updates because yes, our public does need that input and that information as we move forward, but we still need to work through the process of making sure this vaccination is in front of our communities. And I'll just echo a lot of what Councilwoman Nice just said. Um, you know, on March 19th, which would have been, you know, less than a week before the press release regarding this amendment was published, we received an email update from our city county health department officials specifically saying we do not recommend repealing mask mandates at this time, as we want to at least look at uh, what's happening after, um, after spring break, if not, you know, having a longer discussion about that, um, which by my math would have would have been, we would have started looking at data this coming Friday 
to start making that decision. And I think, you know, I'm not going to belabor all of the, um, the discussion that's happened already regarding, you know, collective immunity and, and trying to get there. I think what all I really want to say is that um, rather than spending all of this time and discussion on potentially repealing and even in two weeks, potentially having this discussion again, what if every single one of our council members spent every like opportunity they have to share vaccine opportunities with the public? I have been sharing every single Emmy pod, city county health, the, the tribes, because let's be honest, the reason Oklahoma is at uh, is leading the nation is because of our tribal nations, uh, allowing any anybody, whether they are members indigenous or not of their tribe uh, to come get vaccines. If we spent all of this energy in helping the city county health department get us to herd immunity and collective immunity, we would get there and we would be able to really have a real conversation about um, about ending this manda mask mandate responsibly. And I do wanna say, I mean, as far as the equity piece that Councilwoman Nye spoke to, you know, I, I, I know there's talk about vaccine hesitancy. My worry is that there's actually difficulty in accessing the vaccine for a lot of people. And that's part of what's slowing down our numbers. If you think about somebody who works a low wage job that likely does not have paid time off, long hours, maybe taking public transit, when are they gonna to go to a pod in the middle of the day or even let's be honest on a Saturday when they're probably also working. Um, they don't have time to scroll and hit refresh on the vaxokc.com website to see when those pods pop up and, and get there. So we're not only saying that, you know, we need to focus on getting those pods out. We need to figure out how to really get to those folks who have that difficulty accessing. Um, accessing the vaccine who are likely, like I said, working those low wage jobs that put them at the front lines of uh, contracting the vaccine. They are the workers in our businesses who are ringing up our groceries or serving us our hamburger. Um, and it is, I feel insulted that we would spend so much time in discussion on this discussion rather than on supporting the city county health department and all of our public health network across the state and county and city to get those vaccines to those folks. Um, and so that's, that's all I have to say. Um, I just wanted to echo what Councilwoman Nye says. And, and again, this energy that we're doing, we're, we're sucking out of the room in this conversation is honestly sort of insulting, I think, to our public health officials. And I just really appreciate their um, grace and, uh, and magnanimity, magnanimity through this conversation because um, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm mad. Um, so that's all I have to say. Just in response uh, briefly, uh, Mayor, the one thing I'd like to point out is from day one, Todd Stone and I uh, dealt with uh, met with or talked with uh, city county health. In fact, um, the, the, the dates of March 30th and 31st came from city county health. And we even sent our press release to city county health to Phil Maytubby uh, before it went out so he could comment on it. The one thing that changed was uh, about a week later on Thursday and Friday, we had a spike. And uh, Phil picked up the phone and he called me. Phil picked up the phone and he emailed me uh, and he wanted to talk about it. And that's what we've been doing since. And so I think these conversations are helpful. I think they're productive. I think there are large portions of our citizens that want these conversations. And so um, I, I just want the record to be clear that from day one, Todd and I dealt with City County Health and reached out for their assistance. And they have been uh, great partners in assisting us. Thank you. Speaking of ensuring the record is clear to all of the media who is following today's council, and I'll give you a second, to all media and to any word two constituent as well, let me be as clear as the rain. I will not be supporting this deferral 
because a few weeks ago, our council our OKC County health friends to come speak with us again in a couple of weeks. I look forward to it. I love science. It's great. But I want to make it very clear to our friends in the media. We approved an extension of our mask ordinance on until April 30th. I stand by that April 30th extension. You all heard earlier about when a number of our people would be fully vaccinated in May, what June's really going to look like, and those are the real numbers. And I, I, I am a little frustrated that now some of us who support this, this mask mandate are going to find ourselves probably having to respond to some emails when we don't vote for this deferral because it's going to create confusion. That's what's about to happen. And that is a shame. That is a shame. And that's why I am asking this council again, invite back our county health friends, but do not vote. Just take off this idea of even deferring this at all. And it is critical if, if, we, if we move forward with the deferral, it is critical that our, that the fourth estate, the media, report accurately. And I'm going to keep I'm going to say it one more time. It is critical the fourth estate report accurately that council a few weeks ago voted to extend our mask ordinance until April 30th. I stand by that decision. Nothing has changed that decision. I knew the spike was coming because a couple weeks ago, public health officials warned us what was coming after spring break. They told us. So it is critical that the fourth estate report accurately that April 30th date it is critical. We cannot create confusion in our community. It's critical that we do that. A vote against not deferring this is to say April 30th must be at the earliest we have this conversation. I just wanna be crystal clear on that. Thank you. Can we make a motion to deny the deferral? No, there's already a motion on the table to have a deferral. So <laughs> that has to be addressed first. Um, and so that motion is on the table and why don't we proceed with that? Uh, we have a motion and a second. Mayor, may I ask? Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mayor. May I ask if our fellow council members who put forth that deferral, if they remove that ask, can they do that? And then let of us- Of course they can withdraw a motion, but- And then- and then John that Stafford, do you wish only, to withdraw your motion? That'd be my only ask. And I then- have, May I finish? I was just gonna say, and then let us have that moment just so we can be as clear as the rain to our constituents and then put forth your deferral. Okay, Councilman Stoneserver, do you wish to withdraw your motion uh, for a deferral? So we are crystal clear. Um, April 30th is not tied to any scientific date. Uh, therefore, I do not want to withdraw my motion and I would like it to be voted upon, please. Okay. Well, that is your procedural right. So we have a motion and a second for a deferral and we will now cast our vote. This would defer the item to the next meeting in two weeks. Okay, uh, Councilman McAtee and Stone Cipher. We got McAtee. Okay, Councilman Stone Cipher. I'm guessing you're a yes, but I, I need to hear you say deferral. it. Yes. I vote yes for the deferral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Councilman Greenwell here? Yes, Mayor, I'm here. I can't, uh, my uh, prime gov's not working. I'll have to give a verbal vote. Okay, and how is your vote on the deferral? I'll vote yes for the deferral. Okay. okay. Okay, deferral passes five to four. 
And so that item will appear on the next council agenda. All right, that concludes that item. We're gonna go back to regular order now. And we will, uh, to remind you, we are back on page two and we will recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority where we have items A through H we can take with one motion and there are no presentations. All right, got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Mayor, this is David Green. Well, I'll vote yes. My, okay. Uh, it's not working. Okay. I'll keep calling on you until I hear vote otherwise. Yes. Who are we? We got it ready? All right, passes unanimously. All right, we will now adjourn OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A and B we can take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Oh, Councilman Greenwell, are you able to vote now? Because you made a second. Yes, I'm back. Thank all you. right, good, all right, cast your vote. Please. Are we missing anybody? Yeah. Councilman McAtee and Councilman Stonecipher. Councilman Stone Cypher votes yes, please. Okay. Councilman McAtee, how do you wish to vote? Vote yes. Okay, got it. Passes unanimously. All right, we'll adjourn OCPPA and convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. We merely have one item, claims and payroll item A, but we could take that, uh, take a motion on that. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Oh, Cypher, yes. Okay, we have everybody? Yeah. Councilwoman Hammond. <clears throat> oh, okay, so we can move on then. All right, passes unanimously. We'll adjourn uh, Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, reconvene as the city council and our city council meeting where we find ourselves on page three of your printed agenda, item seven, the consent docket. And we have presentations on item AK and CB. And that is all that is scheduled. So is there another item that a council member wishes to pull out for separate discussion or separate vote? I would, I would like to uh, make a comment about B in okay. anyone else okay all right we'll take them in order then and that means we will start with ak uh mr city manager Thank you, Mayor. On AK, we have Randy Marks here from the Planning Department just to give a quick presentation on an art piece. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and Mr. City, Mr. City Manager. Well, I'm a, at a little bit of a loss here because I wasn't informed, at, at least I didn't receive the notice that I was going to be doing a presentation, just that I needed to talk about this in case it comes up. So I'll be happy to talk and then I'll try to pull up some images too here in just a moment. Um, so the origin of this project was in the recurrent vandalism and graffiti that has hit the Manuel Perez Park, uh, the new Manuel Perez Park, the skate park, uh, the new restrooms and the new equipment storage containers have been repeatedly tagged, painted, re-graffitied, so to speak and so on for the last year or so. It is a well-known phenomenon that intentional murals discourage random graffiti. 
So Parks Department Assistant Director Melinda McMillan Miller asked us to use 1% for art funds uh, for murals for these surfaces. The artists who were selected for this project, Chris Canale, Carlos Barboza, Tony Thunder, AKA Anthony Chase, and Jose Scott proposed designs that went way beyond what we asked for. They put their hearts into this and it really, really shows this is a beautiful and thoughtful project. I'll be happy to answer any questions and I'm going to try to pull up some images here quickly. And uh, hopefully I can show you something in just a moment. Well, while he's doing that, I, um, I just wanted to say that I'm excited about uh, this area of Manuel Perez being brought back to life uh, as far as using the graffiti in a good way. Now we get to add murals to those areas uh, that actually portray Manuel Perez and, and all of the things that make Oklahoma City great. So I, I do think that it's, it's really cool to see the, the renderings that they have brought forward uh, to, to be placed in this area for the skate park. So I'm excited about it. And I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of pictures of folks in front of uh, these murals that'll be placed in the area. Thank you, Councilwoman Nice. I, I can uh, show some images now. And if you can see my screen, you're seeing the artist. This is from their presentation. This is current state of things. These are the containers that are under Shields Boulevard, uh, just recently installed in the park upgrade. Their inspiration, and this is what we're going to see painted on the front sides mm -hmm. of the containers facing, to, facing the west. There's an example. And then this will be painted on the east side. This is uh, approximately the current state of the restrooms, which continually get hit by graffiti. Uh, we're working with uh, general services. They're going to come out and they're going to remove all the graffiti, all of the paint, which is a, uh, a strangely enough, a graffiti resistant paint, installing new doors and upgrading the facility. And then it will be ready for repainting also. These are inspiration um, images. And then we'll see Manuel Perez, who's a Medal of Honor winner, uh, born and lived his early life in Oklahoma City, honored on, as well as references to the uh, nearby skate park and skate culture. Uh, this is directly adjacent to Matt Hoffman Action Sports Park, which is actually incorporated into the new Manuel Perez Park. Some other images. And then there will also be some murals added to the skate park itself on various surfaces. And these are some of the images that we'll see there. I'll note that all of the, um, all of the artists are active uh, skateboarders and uh, they've used this facility many, many times. They're, again, I'll say that they put their heart into this and they're proposing an extraordinary amount of work for the, um, for the art award that they will receive. Again, I'll take any other questions about anything that you've seen. Hey, Randy, it's Todd Stone. Uh, very, very excited to see this. Can you give us an idea of maybe of timeline of, of when we can could expect these mural, murals to be done? Yes, I can. The, um, we'll have a contract. Well, uh, if, if you vote to approve today, uh, there will be a contract with the artists. They'll have their notice to proceed in about a week if things go according to plan. They want to start virtually immediately. General Services intends to have uh, the surfaces ready to be painted around April 13th. We anticipate total completion around the middle of May. Excellent. Great timeline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, Randy, I love I love these. Councilman Stone, you you just invite me over there anytime to tour. And I this is just one of my favorite things we've ever done. I just think this is great. Um, do we have any sort of data or research on I've long suspected as a former middle school teacher, 
I've long suspected that if you gave our kiddos an outlet <laughs> to express themselves, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that bill of rights, importance of freedom of expression, that, that they would do it and that they wouldn't, we wouldn't see a lot of this tagging and the, the, the graffiti, that there's something there in them. Do we have any uh, kind of data or, or, or conversations uh, about the role that public art plays in seeing the, the limiting of, of, of defacing uh, property, but instead engaging folk to become part of it in some ways? Yes, we do. I don't have that right at my fingertips, but I'll be happy to compile that and forward that to you later today. I know that Robbie has a lot of things in file and the Americans for the Arts uh, uh, often tabulates data such as this. So uh, we've seen it anecdotally in various places in Oklahoma City that uh, when a mural goes up, the graffiti virtually disappears uh, and that people take more pride of ownership in whatever that surfaces where the mural is. And I think you can see from uh, Councilman Stone's response, uh, you know, uh, this is this is partially in, in the park is is partially in Councilman Stone's ward and partially in Councilwoman Nice's ward. Uh, I think you can see from their response, uh, the same kind of response that we're going to see from residents of both of those wards in this area. Yeah, I agree. I'd love to see that research and uh, Councilwoman Nice uh, offer, of course, extends to you as well. It's a uh... Let's go on a little tour together with Councilman Stone. So thank you all. Okay. That's everything on that item. Then we will proceed to item BN that Councilman Greiner wished to say a word about. Yeah, this is uh, the project for the for redeveloping the Lantana apartments. Um, and it is finally complete. Uh, so it's kind of poetic that it's on the last day of my last council meeting because this has been something that uh, I've worked with um, our economic development team quite a bit on. And uh, they were late in, in getting the development um, completed. And uh, so they're, they're paying a small fee of, of what all the uh, the liens and everything that was on this uh, apartment complex uh, before the redevelopment happened. Um, but I think that this was a really a win-win-win sort of uh, scenario. You know, the the, uh, the developer wins in, in having a uh, uh, having an apartment complex now that is uh, having revenue for them. The um, neighbors that live around this apartment complex now have a place where it's not a an attraction for um uh crime and fires and all that stuff and then the city wins because we now don't have to uh have a um send the fire department out there all the time and um and a, and a reduction in crime so uh I, I know, and I know that this isn't the only, this was kind of a new idea of how to deal with a, an abandoned dilapidated apartment complex that has a lot of liens on it. And so it was really hindering the redevelopment of it because nobody wanted to, it was, a, it was an, an impediment to redevelop it. And so if, if you guys, if anybody else has apartment complexes out there that, that's like that, um, I, I highly recommend you talking to Brent Bryant and uh, or Craig about it, and um, because I, I think this is a, a pretty good model for how to deal with uh, properties like this. So um, that's all I had. Thanks. I, I just wanted to say I appreciate that, Councilman Greiner. When I was looking at the agenda and saw this item, I was like oh, this is literally something I've asked about and told we were not able to do. So I'm excited to see that there is a precedent for it and, and maybe some opportunity to, to re, um, re uh, yeah, just make, just do a similar thing with other places in the city. Cause it is, like you said, it's a benefit both to the person wanting to redevelop it as well as to the city as a whole and the residents in the area around it. So thank you. Yeah. And I think, the, I think one of the challenges is just going to be finding a developer who wants to do it. You know, because some of these properties, they don't look, uh, they don't look like they are even able to get there. I know this one didn't. And so, uh, so yeah, I appreciate that.
I'll echo Councilwoman Hammond and commend you, Councilman Greiner. That is, it's very impressive. And um, I know Brent is listening to our meetings and I know our council staff is as well. So I'll just go ahead and go on record and uh, say, sign me up for that meeting. And <laughs> I'm happy to learn a little bit more. And again, commend you for what you've done. All right, yes. Thank you, Councilman Greiner. Now we have item CB. Uh, Mr. C. Man. Yes, Mayor, we have uh, Ryan Eshelman with GSB here to give a presentation on the final its plans and specifications for Wellness Center 4. Great, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you all, and it's an exciting day for the MAPS program. Um, as we're at the final plan stage for Wellness Center 4, as you all remember, it's to be located near Southwest 138th and Southwestern on the parcel of land you see on the screen, which includes frontage on Western, uh, as well as uh, a pond that, uh, in, that enters the site on the east side. The site itself is going to include parking fronted on Western, the building you see highlighted in white, the pond that I mentioned, and then the parks department has planned a small park, um, about two and a half acres of land shown in light green, which will wrap um, around the park between the building and uh, wrap around the pond between the building and the pond itself. So the parking will serve both the building and the future park as well. The area you see highlighted in dark green is the limits of this project, which is the building, the parking area, um, and some outdoor spaces. This, this terrace area you see is one of the alternates to the project, which includes a, an outdoor fitness lawn, a handicap accessible raised bed garden, and some terrace space overlooking the pond and park. The building includes all the usual elements for wellness centers. Um, the, the north end of the building includes areas in orange, which are multi-purpose spaces, classroom, art rooms, game rooms, and some get casual gathering spaces in the lobby and great room area, as well as the necessary support functions, administrative spaces and the like. Also includes a demonstration kitchen for healthy cooking classes um, and to support catered events in the large multi-purpose room. The south end of the building includes the fitness components. You'll see a large fitness studio, as well as a flex studio, which can be used, it's shown with spin bikes here, but it has a hard uh, resilient floor. It can be used for classroom and meeting functions as well. And then of course, um, consistent with, with other facilities, there's a large fitness area with a substantial amount of fitness equipment, uh, ample locker rooms and showers to support the hybrid fitness pool. Uh, again, comparable to the other facilities in the, in the city and a full gymnasium which will accommodate a uh, basketball court or three pickleball courts. And as we've seen before, the, the basketball goals don't come down often because pickleball is popular and happening all the time. So we look forward to uh, seeing that activity. And this facility also includes an upper level walking track, 11 laps to the mile overlooking the space below, and fully accessible. This is an elevated view of the facility from Western. So seeing the Western facade as it faces the street, uh, since that's facing the, the warm afternoon sun, there's limited windows um, on the western facade, lots of shading devices, and you can see the volume of the building varies depending upon the use inside. The east side of the building has much more glass and takes advantage of uh, pleasant daylight throughout the day, as well as the views I mentioned of the park and pond. You can see the fitness center there on the left with the elevated walking track with the ribbon windows above and the main great room and lobby space in the center. This is that great room I mentioned with a high volume space looking out to the east over the park area with access to the other facilities and um, casual seating, table seating, and gathering space. The fitness area that I mentioned is two story. Um, there's the gym and pickleball area as well as the fitness equipment. And you can see the, the elevated track looping above. And of course, both of these spaces will look out onto the park and pond as well. We also have a 1% art project, which is in the beginning selection process stages. We've been working with Randy Marks and, and the team on um, that process. And right now it's envisioned that we'll have a suspended art piece in this fitness space um, 
dramatically accentuating the, the fitness and walking area. So we're excited to see that process unfold. And of course, the facility has the pool that I mentioned. Project budget you see before you uh, includes the building and furnishings, um, the land and all the other associated costs. And our most recent cost estimate indicates that the building and the furnishings will fall within that budget. Um, so we're excited to, with your permission to move forward to the bidding phase. In order to get the project in budget, we have outlined a number of alternates, which as you know, give us flexibility both on bid day uh, to adjust to the bidding environment and also as the project proceeds, if we have contingency funds that are made available, um, these are some elements that could be added to the project. But of course, the, the add alternates are elements which are not critical to the operation of the facility um, and they're not in any particular order. Um, this, the MAPS office and the operator, the YMCA, um, could elect with, with available funds to, to add um, any of these elements that they elect to. And our schedule as we move forward, um, bidding intended for April with an early summer construction um, commencement, uh, completing um, in the fall of 2022. So that's an overview of the project and where we are and certainly welcome any questions that you have. Any questions? Uh, this is David Greenwell. Brian, just two questions. First of all, how many parking spaces have been uh, designed, planned for this? Yeah, well, I wish I, wish I had the... I wish I had the exact um, number available at my disposal. Um, I, I do not, and I can certainly send that to you. I, I can tell you that um, when, when the uh, program funds were added to expand the building, there was also funds accounted to expand the parking. Um, one of the things that we know about this site is that there is no adjacent development. Um, so there is no opportunity for overflow parking. So the parking lot has been um, size to accommodate all of the growth that we anticipate as well as traffic to the park. Um, but I'll be happy to look up that parking, that precise parking count and send that to you. No, that's fine. I, and I shouldn't have even brought it up because I know you all take in all the information and you bring up the point I was going to make. There's, you know, unlike the first wellness center, there's just no overflow. So uh, that's right. As long as there's enough spaces for however many people the facility can accommodate, that's fine. My second question, in terms of alternatives, can we throw out another alternative to have some outdoor space? And I think you've got it, whoop, if you'll go back a couple of slides. Sure. On the south end, I believe, there's a little area that says potential outdoor activity space right there. Whoops. No forward now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, apologies. Was it in one of was it in one of the renderings? No, no, no. It's outside of the building. Yeah. Okay. Go forward a couple of, of slides I can point it out to you. Keep going. There it is. Okay. On the far right it says future expansion, 2783 square feet. Sure. To the right of the screen. Yes. So now go down with your arrow. Right. Yeah, there it is. Sure. Lines. Yeah, that that area we have we have um, left a small area at the north end of the building, which you can see highlighted in red on the site plan, um, and yeah. that would allow us to add uh, potentially another small multi-purpose room or. Um, storage space or some additional office space. So because the, the full program was, was funded and built in this footprint, we haven't, we haven't um, anticipated a substantial expansion, um, but we could obviously easily add to the north side of the building here, or we could modify the, the parking lot that will be constructed if we needed additional square footage in the future um, to expand the building. I was thinking in terms of having some type of outdoor activity Oh, okay. You know, the early mine YMCA has a core group of, of members who are out on that outdoor track three, sure. five days a year. But 
the non-hardcore people are out there probably nine months out of the year. And to have either pickleball or basketball courts outdoors. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, can you put some paving out there to accommodate some type of outdoor activity in addition to the very nice indoor facility you, you have? Because some people just prefer doing things outdoors. Ab- absolutely. The other, in, in addition to providing potentially some fill- facilities in that area, is we'll be awaiting the park design um, when when parks does implement the implement the park in this area, and we don't know the specific timing of that. But they may may also be obviously walking paths and other outdoor elements in the park that will become essentially accessories to the wellness center in the future. So that's another opportunity for us to get out and connect outdoors with future facilities that may be added. But you're absolutely right. A, a paved surface in this area could be incorporated as an alternate. Yeah, and then should it ever need to be the building itself expanded, you could convert that area, but it would at least provide an alternative because we have some great weather from March through May. And it's Absolutely. Been, you know, September, October, November sometimes. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. But David, overall, is, it's, it's a great facility. Thank you. David, this is Mark Stonecipher. I think your first question was really important as far as the parking. Just considering yes. the problems that we had with Senior Wellness Center number one, it was so popular we ran out of parking. And so we probably ought to compare notes on, on what happened at number one and make sure we have adequate parking here for this facility. Sure. No, that's what I remember those days, Mark. So thank you. Uh, it might invite someone to uh, find a, a for-profit solution to the excess parking need. Who knows? And Councilman Stonecipher, I will I will add that we were absolutely cognizant of the of the parking um, the parking challenges at Center One because of its success and the, the sizing and design of this parking lot was in, intended to accommodate um, the parking quantities that you're actually seeing. And as you know, part the expansion at Center One will be adding uh, nearly 100 spaces to the capacity there. And so this design is intended to approximate this from day one rather than having any kind of future expansion. So you're absolutely right. The center one's informed a lot about what we understand the parking demand will be. Yeah. Councilman Greenwell, this is this is David Todd, a MAPS program yeah. manager. Um, yeah. Just doing a rough count, we've got nearly 300 spaces in that parking lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. And, and well, I'll just say this. So the Early Y and YMCA at times has parking issues developed, especially in the summertime as more people come out to enjoy the park. At the same time, people are trying to utilize the gymnasium. And so thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for so many beautiful designs and sharing them with us. Um, since this is not my ward, um, you know, I'll let David's uh, councilman uh, Greenwell's preferences here, um, you know, take precedent. <laughs> As we have these conversations with MAPS 4, um, particularly if the, the fifth senior wellness center finds its way, you know, I know we prioritize the Northwest uh, kind of urban core uh, conversation about that particular one. Um, something I heard uh, quite a bit when I was knocking doors, particularly from folk who were 65 and older, um, was this desire, the, the reason why they love and were championing, even if they're not right now using public transportation, it was something they really wanted to see us uh, address in MAPS 4, and we did, right? Where we said, you know, two more bus rapid transits prioritizing the northeast side and south side of our city um, that would ultimately connect with the one we're receiving on the northwest side of our city. And those seniors told me frequently that even though they're not right now using public transportation, that A, they often do when they travel, uh, B, they're really just waiting for that kind of 15 minute frequency conversation that we know in the, the transportation industry um, gets choice riders to, to leave their car behind. 
And those seniors told me they really want to, that transportation, public transportation allows them, and this was often their words, to age in place with dignity, to, to age in the homes where they've made their, their memories, right? Um, that's the role of transportation. And I know, David, now that I think about it, you and I, of course, have served, you know, honorably on COPPA for years. So you've heard a lot of these conversations too. So I think a question I would have for us going forward, and I don't know at all what's possible here and it doesn't seem like it's possible here, but I would like for us to think about how public transportation can connect our seniors, particularly as they become less comfortable with the idea of driving, right? My mom, when we hang out outside of her house and she's driving, she now, you know, 77 and she does not like driving at night. Like that's just, I've seen that shift in her. It makes her very cautious. And I, I think about that when I was listening to you all's parking conversation here, that as seniors age, many of them don't feel comfortable driving. And so I wonder about the connectivity with Embark's mobility management services, like what conversation we can have with this particular senior wellness center. I think that's important. I also think, and I'm just getting at the idea from looking at this covered area here, I think about our seniors you know, who do drive to this facility, you know, walking across this paved surface, which David mentioned the um, times of year when our weather can be pleasant, but in those summer months where it's just the sun pouring down on us, I do worry about that kind of lack of cover across. And I wonder if there's potential here for covering across the parking lot. Um, again, that's just a question, not necessarily advocating, just asking. But I am advocating that as these conversations move forward with MAPS 4, um, considering the role that public transportation plays in MAPS 4, considering that we're talking about the possibility of a new wellness center in MAPS 4, that we really think about, you know, um, conversations where um, we're connecting folk to these facilities um, with public transit and, and the role that the necessity of that, it, this isn't just me advocating for public transit, this is me remembering conversations I heard with seniors who, uh, you know, are, are, who worry about their driving years ahead of them. So those are the three things I'm thinking about is just like, what, what possibility in terms of kind of providing some protection from the, sh from the sun, some shade in the parking lot. Um, and then just thinking about going forward uh, with this facility, what are those opportunities to connect seniors to um, these facilities with mobility services? And then finally, as we move into MAPS 4, um, making sure that we are actually prioritizing um, that concern I heard from seniors. Hey, James. Yes, David. Uh, you know, this would fit in well in terms of public transportation with the idea that I brought up back when I was on the uh, COPTA board meeting, having a little circular route to where you begin at Oklahoma Community College, Oklahoma City Community College, and then go by the new Amazon Fulfillment Center along I-44, but then come back up to 134th, where this is just a few blocks south of there. And then you could serve, uh, Mid-America College, you could serve the uh, more Norman both uh, more Norman Technology Center, the Southwest Library Center, and then connect here and then come back down to Oklahoma City Community College. I think forward thinking, instead of having the spoke and wheel type of, of uh, public transportation, we've got to look beyond that and have smaller circular type routes that then can connect to those folks and wheel type of public transportation. And so this is, becomes a part, one of the stops of a mini route that can also connect to the main route that would take you into downtown Oklahoma City. I do remember you mentioning that. Uh, thanks for refreshing my memory. And yeah, I, I know Embark's listening. Um, yeah, just thinking about what's possible in connecting folk there. I thank you for, for that refresher, David. And I think we could use those little circular routes throughout the city. This is just one example of it, but you could have a group of, of stops in all parts of the city. You know, there are areas that we need to somehow connect 
that we're not able to connect currently because of the overall route system. Now, I understand why we have to use the current route system. I'm just saying to supplement it, I think, look at these small little circular areas within a particular part of the community. And that little circular area can then be connected to the main routes that take you to downtown. Anyway, we're getting off the subject, but it's since you're on the top of the committee, I mean, top of the board, I hope at some point you all at least discuss the possibility to supplement the current routes. The timing's good because as you know, we're doing the, uh, Nelson Nygaard, the consultant's coming back, right? And oh, we're good. No, that timing. Yeah. So thanks for that reminder. And again, I know Embark's listening to this. So hopefully between their listening and me hearing your remarks, uh, <laughs> our memories won't let us down as that Nelson Nygaard uh, renewed study gets underway. And uh, again, I know David Todd is on here and thinking about MAPS 4. And so I uh, just wanted to reiterate my, my, uh, my support of connecting folk. Um, through well, transit. And, yeah, and James, the nice thing about this type of route, you would be, uh, because it's never a problem, you're mixing college age students, because many of the students, for example, at Mid-America uh, College live in the dorms and don't have vehicles, and so they don't have access, and uh, you can connect the college students with the older adults and everybody in between. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think these small little circular routes can play a big role in, in our overall public transportation. Anyway, I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up everyone's time. No, Thanks. don't apologize, David. That is, th these are conversations worth having. <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree. Okay. Well, that's it for the consent docket. We can uh, take a motion for its adoption now. Got a motion in a second, cast your votes as soon as you're able. Mayor, it's knocking me out, so I'll just, may I vote? Uh, yes, how would, you, how would you like to vote? Yes, please, thank you. Okay. Similarly, mine is having a little bug, so I will also vote yes. It's working now. Can't have all nine of us working at the same time, so it's passed around. What's going on with the system? Oh, okay. I just see waiting. So, all right, I'll take your word for it. There we go. Passes unanimously. All right. Now we'll proceed to the concurrence docket. We have items A through T we can take with one motion. in a second cast your votes as soon as you have that opportunity if anyone's having trouble just call her out mine's still uh frozen up so i will vote yes okay same mayor uh mine's frozen and i too okay. yes please okay Passed, passes unanimously. Okay. This brings us to page 13 of your printed agenda, item nine, items requiring separate votes. We have a pretty healthy uh, planning and traffic docket today. So let's dig in, shall we? We have item 9A, 
This is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval at 9802 East Wilshire Boulevard going from R1 to AA. And Councilwoman Nice, we have the applicant here, but uh, only if questions are necessary. Thank you. Um, I know we did ask questions of the applicant, so I do understand there were no protests. So with this, I will move for approval. All right. There we go. It looks like we can do the motion in second now. Cast your votes. Yeah. Councilwoman Hammond? Yes. You, no, okay. Passes unanimously. All right, item 9B, ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 701 Northwest 122nd Street, going from PUD 707 to I-1 and I-2. Uh, Councilwoman Nice, no one has signed up to speak. Okay, um, with this, I will go ahead and move for approval. There were no protests at planning commission. I've right, got a motion and a second. Cast your vote. I will vote yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. All right, item 9C. This is ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 1029 Southwest 89th Street going from R1 to C3. Uh, Councilman Greenwell, no one has signed up to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'll try to help us out and move quickly on both C and D. But C, I've spoken with the owner, uh, the applicant several times, uh, and this was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. There's been no protests and I would move for approval. All right. A motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 9D is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 13401 South May Avenue going from AA to PUD 1800. And Councilman Greenwell, we do have somebody who signed up to speak on this. Uh, it's Brad. Red, I think. I'm not sure. App uh, representing the applicant, but okay, only if you uh, probably only if he wants to. Uh, probably only okay. if you have questions. I think. Well, no, I, I've looked at this, uh, and he is welcome to speak if he'd like to mention anything. But uh, we think this is going to be a nice addition to the area. Uh, there's been no protests, and the planning commission has approved this unanimously. So, uh, if the applicant would like to say anything, he's welcome to. Uh, otherwise, I, I'll move for approval. I bet he'd love for that to for you to do that. So I'll just, we'll just go ahead and take the motion. Okay, thank you. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item nine E is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval. Uh, 9900 Piedmont Road going from R1 to PUD 1805. And if I am reading this correctly, uh, Councilman Griner, there, Brad Red or Reed is also here to uh, represent this applicant if you have any questions. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah staff recommended approval. Uh, Planning Commission unanimously approved it. Uh, there hasn't been any protest. It's a slight modification from the standard R1 that changed some of the uh, 
uh, lot size, uh, lot sizes, um, but no major changes. So uh, that I will move for approval. Hey, uh, Councilman Greiner, I apologize. I was just uh, just discovered a protest uh, speaker oh. on this item. So let me call him up. Kevin Joliefe. I'm here. Kevin on the line. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, my name is Kevin Jolf. I live at 10001 North Piedmont Road. Uh, five years ago, myself and several neighbors came to a meeting before the council to oppose the construction of a new development in northwest corner of Mustang and Britain. My argument in the meeting was for the safety of the roads and the quality of the roads in our region and the city in light of adding 1,200 plus homes to this region should a proposal pass. We were unsuccessful in swaying the vote and it was passed eight to one. The very next morning, a high school student from Yukon was killed in an auto accident at a very deadly corner of Britain Highway 4, also known as Piedmont Road. Since that time frame five years ago, Redstone Ranch construction has begun. A new intermediate school has been built at Britain and Mustang, and there are three new developments laying the groundwork for construction, along with growth of already existing developments, all within about a one and a half mile square. To say this area is booming with construction is a bit of an understatement, and the possibility for future growth based on available land is not unlimited, but very significant to say the least. <clears throat> However, my concerns five years ago are still the same concerns today. The concerns, however, are certainly amplified. The only improvements to the infrastructure specifically related to the roads is that one mile of Britain Road from Highway 4 to Mustang has been resurfaced with new asphalt since the school was built. There's also been the removal of the flashing yellow lights at the intersection of Britain Highway 4, and there's construction of Highway 4 that is underway. However, this is not to widen the roads to handle more traffic, by adding lanes, but only to add eight foot shoulders on each side of the road and turn lanes of the intersections. Today, my argument is against a proposal of changing the zoning, which would allow the lot size to be nearly 20% smaller than the original plan, which then in turn increases the number of homes being built. This lessening of lot sizes increases the number of homes and only increases the number of cars and people of this space, adding the concerns for traffic volume and the ability of the current infrastructure to handle the increasing volumes. Words can't describe to you, nor does having this meeting on Zoom allow me to adequately show you the very dismal quality of the road conditions of the roads where I live. From Highway 4 to the Kilpatrick Turnpike on Wilshire Road is a road that is the poorest quality of road conditions I believe I've ever driven in Oklahoma City. The road is essential as it is an access point to the turnpike and it is the last road heading south on Highway 4 that allows you to drive in Oklahoma City without having to go all the way <clears throat> into Oklahoma City or into Yukon. <clears throat> Beyond the renovation of the mile of Britain Road, the conditions return back to Abysmal and Hefner Road is not that far behind in its uh, level of quality. Beyond the conditions of the roads, the infrastructure at its current pace is not sufficient to handle the traffic that we currently do have. For at least 45 minutes in the afternoon, there are cars lined up to pick their children from Surrey Hills Elementary. This line can go back sometimes a quarter of a mile or maybe more. Hefner Road leading up to the school is only two lanes which leads the parents to park on the side of the road, which obstructs the eastbound traffic, requiring people to drive in the center, if not into the oncoming traffic of the westbound traffic. At the corner of Hefner, Hefner and Morgan, in the morning times, there can be lines backed up due to traffic congestion that can take six to seven minutes just to make it through that intersection and stop sign due to the north and southbound traffic of Morgan Road. This is in the midst of COVID with much less traffic on the road. Imagine if everyone was heading into the office. I realize I can't stop growth. It's only logical to acknowledge that homes are going to come because the land is going to be available as farmers and rangers retire and sell out. However, I believe according to Oklahoma statutes, title 11, section 43-102, that there is a legal recourse for declining this proposal and an obligation on your part to at least consider not only the rejection of this proposal, but the slow adoption and growth of this area of the city with any new development project proposals, at least until the infrastructure of this area can handle the rapid growth that is, it is witnessing. According to the Oklahoma statute title 11, one of the objectives is to lessen congestion in the streets. And this gives you the council, the ability to regulate development in a reasonable, legally defensible way. By letting any and any, any and every developer build, and in this case, build even more homes than originally proposed without truly updating our infrastructure to handle the capacity, we are not lessening that congestion. We're dramatically increasing it. According to plan OKC, which I understand is meant to serve as a goal and framework for how the city develops, SU-15 states that it can require developers to construct or fully fund infrastructure needed to serve their development. And also it requires developers to wait until the city or the state as the case may be, constructs the infrastructure needed to serve their development. Before you cast a vote on something that isn't a part of maybe your daily routine because you're not from my ward and district, I would encourage you to come out and experience firsthand what I'm saying. Drive the roads, 
fight the traffic, dodge the oncoming cars near the release of school times, and then ask yourself if you truly believe the infrastructure is truly capable of handling all the homes that are being built, and should we continue to increase the density of homes to be built to compound the current problem before that current problem can be fixed by addressing the issues of infrastructure. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Greiner, I, I think that Brad read or read is for the applicant and would you like to hear yeah, from him? Yeah, let's hear from him. Okay, Brad, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Yes, and please, uh, it's not your fault, it's the handwriting. What's your last name? It's Brad Reed. Okay, got it, all right, go ahead, sir. Uh, Brad Reed with Craft and Soul, 300 Point Parkway Boulevard, uh, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, what we do have is uh, it's, it's 60 acres, 68 acres on a 320 acre tract, as he mentioned earlier in his, in his comments. Um, uh, the developer is given 15 acres to the Redstone Intermediary School. Um, we have some, some differentiating zoning that's been on this 320 acres, which we think is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Um, this is, is five dwelling units an acre. Comprehensive plan for this area allows for four to eight. Uh, we think this is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Um, also, as mentioned, Piedmont Road was recently um, had some some work done to it, um, and and this developer will pay impact fees um, for every house that's built out there. Which everyone knows, the, the those fees go to um, fixing you know, areas um, that they're developed in. So uh, we think that we're in conformance to the comprehensive plan. We we were unanimously approved at Planning Commission, and we'd ask for your approval on this one as well. Okay, um, so I mean, a lot of what Mr. Jolliff, Jolliff, I don't know how, how it was said, but um, what he said was, is true. I mean, the, the, the development out here is booming. Um, and uh, I appreciate his uh, argument of making a legal, trying to make a legal argument of how to deny it. And uh, I don't know if that is really legally. I, I don't know if we would succeed in a uh, uh, if we denied it and then they protested it to the district court or not, uh, just arguing that the road infrastructure is, isn't good or traffic or whatever. But um, I think that this does, like Mr. Reed said, does conform to the comp plan. Uh, I think the planning staff agrees with that. And I think that the planning commission agreed with that. And so I don't know if Jeff Butler or Bob Teener on to address that issue. Um, either one of them on. I believe they're on here. This is Bob Teener. I was kind of waiting for Jeff for the comp plan uh, question, but okay. that's correct. It does meet the requirements or the recommendation that the conference is already gone. Oh, okay. oh, wait. So, um, you know, the as the applicant talked about, there will be impact fees paid on all the development that in that new uh, plat <coughs> that will address those concerns. Right. Some of those concerns. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, if anybody else doesn't have any issues or they need to ask any questions, I will go ahead and move for approval like I was going to do uh, earlier. Okay. We've got a motion for approval in a second. Cast your votes. Uh, Council members Cooper and Hammond. James has his camera off. Okay. Mine's frozen up again, but I'll vote yes. Okay. And then if Councilman Cooper's camera is off, I think we consider him. I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry. Oh. oh. Uh, yes. Okay. That <laughs> passes unanimously. All right. Item. 9F. This is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 12800 Northwest 10th Street going from AA to PUD 1806. Uh, Councilman McAtee, we do not have anyone signed up to speak. 
Okay, I think the applicant is also present, is he not? I don't know. He didn't sign up, but uh, if we wouldn't know who to look for. Um, I am present. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead. If with no protest, this is a, a zoning for a, a car lot. Uh, I move for approval, if it's all right with the applicant and doesn't want to talk. Applicant? Well, that, that's fine. We'll we'll let the motion go forward. <laughs> okay. All right, we've got a motion and a second. It's coming up. All right, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9G is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 13450 Southeast 104th Street. Going from AA to PUD 1807, uh, Councilman Stone. Thank and you, uh, we do have the applicant available for questions, Blake Donaldson. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a request for a uh, development out around 104th and Henny Road. Uh, it was passed unanimously by the Planning Commission, no protests. Uh, it's a request basically for a four lot development. Uh, if no one has any questions on it, I will move for approval. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, 9H is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval. It is 1137, 1139, 1143, and 1145 North Meridian going from 02 to SPUD 1265. Councilman McAtee. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, is the applicant present? Um, yes, Cassie Nichols is here. Cassie, if you would just give a brief overview of what the plans are for this uh, auto land. Uh, Cassie, be, be sure to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so this was uh, put together as an office um, facility, and we are just wanting to change the zoning so that some retailers can come in. Uh, we are the property management company. A lot of applicants wanting to bring retail into the area. And, uh, this allow for the Okay, there were no protests on this. Uh, unless there's someone here to speak, uh, I move for approval. All right, we'll take a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9I, this is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 2421 South Portland Avenue going from C3 to SPUD 1277. And Councilman McAtee, this is the one millionth and final planning case of your council career. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, is the applicant present? Um, yes, T. Alec Bath. If, yes, uh, maybe give a brief overview of what the plans are. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your time, Council. Uh, this piece of property is currently zoned C3. Uh, the applicant would like to construct a uh, metal building for his uh, lawn care sprinkler irrigation business. Uh, C3 zoning doesn't currently pr allow for a metal building. Uh, so we've gone through the spud zoning. Uh, we have added additional uh, trees and landscaping to help buffer us from the uh, adjacent residential. He is also a resident of the uh, adjacent residential living across the street. So he has an interest in making sure this property is uh, kept up. So we worked through all the technical evaluations with planning commission and they unanimously approved it. And we respectfully request you to approve it today. 
Thank you. There are no protests. Uh, you do agree with the technical evaluations, as you mentioned. So given that, uh, I move for approval. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, item 9J. This is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval um, at 4019 and 4027 North Classen Boulevard going from 02 and R2 to SPD 1289. Uh, Councilman Cooper, no one has signed up to speak. Councilman Cooper, are you there? Sorry, I muted. Um, sure. Yes, while no one has signed up to speak, is the applicant present? Yes, sir. This is uh, Tim Johnson with Johnson and Associates on East Sheridan Avenue. Oklahoma City. Um, we're here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this is a, uh, there's two buildings on uh, in this tract at 40th and Classen, uh, both existing buildings. The one on the south was utilized for many years uh, as an architect's office. Um, and the one on the north uh, is a, an old home that was been utilized for several things over the years, but at current on ownership has uh, applied and had special use permits to allow for outdoor sales uh, and presentation. So he sold Christmas trees, he sold, uh, he did a pumpkin patch and he intends to continue that type of outdoor sales. And so that what this PD would do is allow that. And that would also uh, allow the uh, office building to the south to be correctly zoned for its use, which is a uh, therapist's office. And uh, we did not have any protest at Planning Commission. It was unanimously approved. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I also just want to applaud you all for uh, figuring out how to, um, you know, get us to this place where we're we don't we're not hearing those protests. Uh, I'm I'm very impressed, uh, Tim and Mark and Sean. So. Uh, thank you, and thank you to the neighbors. Uh, if any of them worked with you as well, I think that's, I think that's just wonderful news. And with that, I would move for approval. Okay, we got a motion. Let's do that virtually, and a second. Cast your votes. Oh, he texted me that he has stepped out. Is his camera off? Councilman Greenwell is not present at the moment. So we can skip him. Okay, passes unanimously. All right, uh, item 9K is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval at 12501 North Pennsylvania Avenue from PUD 62A to SPUD 1291. Councilman Stonecipher, uh, we have we have a couple people that are available, both from the applicant and the developer, Brian Berger and Heather Rimmer. Now this uh, this rezoning uh, was unanimously approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, there are no protests. I'm not aware of anybody that signed up to a protest. And if, if there are none, I'd move for its approval. All right. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item L was previously deferred at the beginning of the meeting, which brings us to item M. This is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval uh, at 2604 Cedar Tree Road, going from PUD 704 to SPUD 1294, Councilman Stone Cipher. Uh, no one has signed up to speak. Sure. And this is again an application to rezone. 
protest. There's no one signed up in protesting here today. And so I'd move for the items approval. approval. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Uh, Councilman Sunsecker, are you able to vote? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Okay, and to close out the planning docket, we have item N, um, ordinance on final hearing recommended for denial at 10620 Northwest 164th Street from AA to R1. Councilman Greiner, this is your slightly smaller number than Council McAtee's uh, planning case and your last one and way to go out on an, on an intriguing one. So yeah. I'll turn it over to you, but nobody has signed up to speak. Yeah, this is a, a lot smaller than Larry's number, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this one is weird. Um, you know, it had a staff recommended uh, denial, planning commission recommended denial, uh, no protests yet still it's here. And so, um, I would really like to start off with um, the applicant kind of explaining their perspective on this and then, sure. uh, yeah, then we'll move on from there. So can you hear me and see me? Uh, Mason Schwartz, 522 Calcord Drive. Um, if the address sounds familiar, it's because we're filling in for Mr. Box today. Um, I also have uh, Tim Johnson and Mark Zitzow with Johnson and Associates here discuss as well we'll keep it brief you know it's the end of the docket um this application is is rezoning application for 83 acres um, from straight aa to r1 it's located in an area of the northwest piece of the city where uh, it's bounded on the north by the city of piedmont across 164th street uh, it's kind of bounded from a general area standpoint by the kilpatrick turnpike on the southeast and then northwest expressway on the Southwest um, and within that pocket um, of the city up there, there's been a lot of change, a lot of growth in the last five years. Um, the proximity to those highways, the expressway and the Kilpatrick Turnpike, as well as proximity to Piedmont schools, and some other factors have generated a lot of market demand um, for uh, this type of residential housing up there. And so we feel uh, like it's uh, ripe for rezoning. Um, and I think if you look to the zoning regulations that provide for the establishment and purpose of the rezoning process. It says that process is intended to make adjustments to this chapter in response to changed conditions or changes in city policy. And I think that's exactly what you have here, uh, changing conditions more specifically. Um, sewer and water, uh, most notably, are now available to the property and will be extended. Um, in addition, uh, adequate fire service is going to be provided to the property as well. And that's why we have uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Zitz out here uh, to discuss a little bit more in detail about that um, and how that will work with the mutual aid services um, in, in the discussions we've had with Piedmont. So I will turn it over to them and then uh, jump back on here uh, to field any questions and go from there. Thanks, Mason. This is Tim Johnson again, uh, one East Sheridan, uh, Oklahoma City. And on with me is Mark Zitzow, one of he's the director of urban planning for our firm. And we're celebrating 33 years this month of doing land use planning in Oklahoma City. And Mark is one of four urban planners on our staff. So uh, we did quite a bit of research and work on this site, knowing that uh, we would be challenged by the staff uh, in working on the plan OKC change. Uh, as part of that, we did uh, phone calls and had uh, virtual meetings with the Piedmont leadership. We do understand through Oklahoma City Fire and Piedmont Fire, there's an agreement uh, underway to uh, provide cross service, uh, shared service across the municipal borders. Uh, and as well as we did the research on the utilities to, and their ability to be extended to the site and serve it. So we did a fairly lengthy presentation to the Planning Commission. So uh, Mark has abbreviated that for your sake. And we're going to hit some highlights. If Mark, can you, can you share your screen? There we 
we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. And you can see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Zitzel with Johnson & Associates, 1E Sheridan Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm going to run through kind of a, an abridged version uh, of the presentation that we gave, uh, just kind of to help everyone familiarize themselves with the, with the property. So the first thing that I would call your attention to, this is the uh, land use typology map from Plan OKC. Uh, within it, it talks about kind of this three-legged stool approach to lifting an urban reserve, uh, current urban future layer. And underlined here, uh, fire service is a target. It's a, it's a targeted uh, time response to a property. Water and sewer is clear whether or not you have it. Uh, it's almost like a checkbox. So um, our developer is proposing bringing water and sewer to the site. Um, Tim mentioned the mutual, uh, the automatic aid agreement that the Piedmont fire marshal and fire chief uh, stated they are working with Oklahoma City to finalize. Uh, so I won't go into that too much more. I did want to point out that within Oklahoma City's uh, urban low area that roughly 22% is currently considered rural or longer than rural response times. So our request is not inconsistent with development patterns that exist primarily along the fringe. So, uh, you know, I won't go through all of these, but listed on the left are a series of developments that would have a similar uh, fire response time to our proposed development. Uh, and that includes a lot of Northwest Oklahoma City. So uh, the Gallardia area is rural, uh, much of the area to the north around the Deer Creek Elementary School area would be considered longer than rural, uh, yet development has continued to occur in that area. So I did wanna point uh, your attention to just one of the uh, recent cases, this was a case last year, uh, of what we believe to be a similar request. Uh, an applicant came through requesting uh, a development on the eastern part of Oklahoma City near Tinker Air Force Base. Um, and I will read verbatim a piece from the staff report. It is unlikely there will ever be additional fire stations built within the area in the future due to the proximity of the city boundary. However, the city of Oklahoma City hopes to develop an automatic aid agreement for fire service with the city of Midwest City in the near future. While urban levels of service are preferred, lower levels are sometimes unavoidable at municipal boundaries. This was in a staff report uh, a year ago uh, in February of a very similar case directly on the border uh, at the fringe of the city and staff noted that fire stations are unlikely to be built at the fringe of the city and then additionally, that they were working with the mutual aid agreement with Midwest City. We understand from Piedmont that they also are working on that mutual aid agreement. So uh, our proposed development uh, does sit within that urban future. Uh, we, you know, and I think Mr. Butler would, would talk to this. There are countless ways to do this type of analysis. Uh, we ran one that we believe to be very similar to how Plan OKC would run the analysis using the data. Uh, and what we found when you apply these buffers and you take into account the Piedmont fire station, uh, which is about two miles away from our subject site, that our area would fall within an urban fire service level. Now we understand that when staff does their analysis, they're stopping it at a city limit, which makes sense. Uh, however, knowing that an automatic aid agreement uh, is forthcoming, we thought uh, that this was an appropriate way to examine the site. So when you take into account, Piedmont's fire station would provide urban levels of service with an automatic aid agreement, water and sewer would be extended. We believe that we meet that three tiered stool from the comprehensive plan. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I turn it over uh, to Mr. Schwartz. And sure, so just a, a few follow-up points on that. Um, and I think that, so staff did recommend denial of the conference plan and planning commission as well. Um, and we think that uh, obviously we disagree with that decision. And the 
the decision as to whether or not to lift the urban future um, as the comprehensive plan provides should be based on this availability of water, sewer, uh, and, and fire service. And uh, I think that the, the submissions that we've you know, put forward uh, demonstrated that we are um, equal to the water and sewer provided in many other residential developments in this, in this general area. Uh, and perhaps even better when you add in the, the fire um, emergency services of Piedmont. And so we think that the it's consistent, it's compatible with the general growth pattern of the larger area. Um, and one thing, I, uh, last thing I kind of want to address is the idea that there might be some sort of leapfrogging, or if you look at this on a map and you might think that it's, it's out in Island, <laughs> it's really not. Uh, when you look at development that has occurred over the last five years uh, to the north uh, of the Turnpike and the expressway, um, it has been significant uh, leading back up to that Deer Creek floodplain uh, area. And, and so it's, the property is somewhat bounded by that floodplain and that development on the south. And then Piedmont has been growing um, extremely fast along that north end of 164th as well. And so uh, this property is actually, when you look at it in the context of the surrounding mile, uh, more of a sandwich situation uh, when you actually look at the way the topography is and the uh, pattern of land use development over the last five years since the, the comprehensive plan designation was first put in place. Uh, so we believe that the uh, city council certainly has the authority, um, despite the uh, planning commission's decision to um, deny the comp plan change, we believe the council has the authority to uh, approve this rezoning request based on these change of conditions. Uh, so we would uh, ask for your approval and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, guys. Um, Mayor, the nobody else has signed up, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, just a, just a few of my thoughts, and then I'll I kind of share. Uh, here, just a few of my thoughts. All right. So the the main issue for me in zoning applications is normally is is the proposed development compatible with the areas around it. And because I think that is the main purpose of what zoning is, is to protect the, the surrounding properties from uh, their property rights being infringed on the new development. And so, and in this case, it's not, uh, I, I don't think anybody would disagree, disagree with that, that a, that a single family development here right across the street from single family development and in an area that we're already saying is gonna be urban future is gonna be uh, uncompatible. And so the reason that it is urban future is because it didn't have water, doesn't have sewer, and uh, it's got a rural uh, fire. Well, like Mr. Schwartz already addressed, he, um, uh, all, all three of those are, are addressed in, uh, in his, uh, his, his statement. So I, I would say that, you know, the, it, it's really hard for me to put, be put in this position because I'm basically saying that the staff is wrong if I say that I, I want to approve this. But I'm not saying that because I actually think that this planning staff did a really good job of evaluating this and did and actually probably probably came to the right conclusion from their perspective. And I think the planning commission did the same thing, you know, because I, I, I had a meeting with uh, with my planning commissioner and um, and Jeff Butler, and we both and I told them that this development isn't what we would prefer, what the city would prefer. Um, but this whole idea of urban future is, well, future is going to be here at some point. And, and in my mind, the future is whenever the property owners say that it's ready to be developed and, and say that they're willing to spend the money to bring out the utilities and to actually develop it. And so maybe we think that the, the urban future should be, you know, 10 years down the road, um, and ideally that's probably the best scenario. But right now this property owner is saying, well, we wanna do it in the extremely near future. And so for me, just my perspective, I can't sit here on my very last city council meeting and say to a property owner that they can't, they can't do something on their property that is compatible with the things that are around it. Um, so yeah, th those are my thoughts and uh, I'll uh, 
open it up to any, I'm sure some of the other council members have some questions or comments, so. Okay, comments or questions for Councilman Greiner? I'd like to hear a little bit more from staff just to respond to what the applicants were saying. Cause I mean, looking at it, what it sounds like to me is that the developer wishes that they had bought land in Piedmont, not in Oklahoma city. So it just, it seems, and I think even Mr. Zitzow said, it's sort of as seems like it's on an Island. And as far as Oklahoma city is concerned, it kind of is. So um, I'd just like to hear more from staff about what, kind of what went into their recommendation, I suppose. Okay, and I'm, I've got to step out for just a few minutes. I'm turning it over to Vice Mayor Greenwell. Yeah, uh, yeah this is Jeff Butler, Planning Director. Um, so uh, when we look at this, it, really it's all about timing. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of, been, uh, have been a lot of good comments uh, made. Um, it, yes, the, the three-legged stool is uh, is definitely uh, part of Plan OKC, and we do look at water and sewer. Water and sewer, in this case, are <clears throat> are um, not too far away, and the developer has, of course, agreed to extend those. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, fire and emergency services, however, are are uh, a, a bit farther than we would like to see, and moreover. <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned, the issue is about timing. If you, and Plan OKC is um, one of the foundational concepts is that timing matters. And if, if you extend infrastructure or build development in an area that <clears throat> I guess is, is on an island, um, as, as kind of has already been alluded to, whether, whether or not this is on an island. But if you extend an infrastructure uh, too far or too early, then what you end up with is a situation where you're uh, <clears throat> you're maintaining that infrastructure for you know three decades or two or even one decade uh, early, and that has cost the city. And those were quantified when we did our plan of KC analysis. Um, <clears throat> so so that matters. Timing matters, and and really, as has been said, uh, we do have um, this is expected to urbanize eventually and I think eventually is the key word and that's what uh, the planning commission in their vote kind of expressed and in the staff report as well uh, we feel like this is a good urban future um, but the timing is not quite right um, <clears throat> the the fire services uh, the difference between this case and, and the other case that, that was referenced is that <clears throat> The uh, the other case was in a situation where we would never really have the opportunity to have better fire and emergency services. Uh, whereas in this case, that that's not the case. We we actually have been considering putting a fire station out there uh, for some time now. It didn't quite make it into the 2017 bond, uh, but we anticipate putting one out there. Uh, to serve this area. So fire service can improve in this area and we expect to improve. Um, so that, that's, that's another difference. Um, you know, we could, we could talk, go into details about, you know, how we, how we estimate the, the, the travel time. And I'm happy to address that if the council would like. Uh, happy to answer any other questions if I didn't uh, just kind of try to cover things in a nutshell. Uh, so happy to elaborate or answer any questions. Yeah, and, uh, and that fact that we actually could improve the fire actually could be an argument for the development before doing it now. Um, it, it does hurt the timing argument, but it does. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> no, I appreciate that. No other questions? Um, Okay, so I had one more point before we vote, but uh, the reason that I really appreciate the staff and the planning commission's uh, decisions on these is that it, it really has forced the developer to make their case to us. I feel like they've made their case, um, but th th that, that's, just what, uh, that's just what I believe. I, I think that they've made their case and that it is a it is appropriate to do it at this time. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. 
<clears throat> okay, a motion's been made and been seconded. So we will now vote. Uh, if anybody's having difficulty voting, please let us know. Otherwise, we will just consider uh, that perhaps someone has stepped away. Yeah, it looks like Councilman Cooper was disconnected. Oh, okay. Well, um, so let's see, it passed six to one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Councilman Greiner and McAtee, I've presented before you for many years, and I wanted to say that you'll be greatly missed. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Jim. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I believe we are now on item O. Councilman Cooper, are you with us? Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we move on to the next available item? And then when Councilman Cooper can rejoin us, we'll go back to his uh, items. So we'll skip over to item, item U. Uh, establishing a no parking anytime restriction on the west side of South Woodward Avenue from Southwest 44th Street to approximately 450 feet south of the South Curb Line. Councilman McAtee, uh, could you unmute? I think you're good now. Councilman McAtee, I think we're we're going to skip over okay. Councilman's items until he returns. And so the next item is item number U. It's okay, this is a uh, signage deal in Ward 3. Uh, there were no uh, opposition to it. Uh, I move for approval. Okay, thank you. Please vote. Okay, it passes unanimously. Thank you. Councilperson Hammond, uh, item number V, establishing 60 degree angle parking within a proposed setback area on the east side of North Brookline Avenue from approximately 30 feet south to 97 feet south of the south curb line of Northwest 23rd Street. Yes, these are, um, this is like you said, this is an item for a parking space just south of 23rd Street and I will move for approval when it comes up on the screen. Okay, thank you. Please vote when it's available. Thank you. Still 
And it's approved unanimously. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor Greenwell. I have okay. returned. Thank you. And I understood we skipped over several Ward 2 items, correct? Yes, we're right? on item Mayor. Yes. Okay, so, uh, and I understand Councilman Cooper is also here now, correct? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so let's go back to, let's go back to item 9-0. Uh, this is an ordinance on final hearing establishing 90 degree angle parking within an on-street parking area on the east side of North Barnes Avenue, et cetera. Councilman Cooper. Yes, thanks for your patience, everyone. I stepped away briefly. Uh, is staff available to uh, speak to uh, just a brief history of how we arrived at these items that are, uh, I mean, there's multiple items here that are part of the 39th Street uh, um, Street Enhancement Project that's well underway. And I'd just like to hear uh, a brief history of, again, how we arrived at these particular uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, I don't know who would like to speak to that, that's from planning or if Kim Cooper Hart is with us or whomever. Councilman Cooper, this is Eric Quinger, the Public Works Director. Happy to respond to the questions. Um, there are actually six items that are on the agenda today, and all of them are related to the Northwest 39th Streetscape that's a part of the Better Street Safer City Program. As we complete these types of projects and street enhancement projects, um, and we go through and we reconfigure streets, and in this case, we're reconfiguring Northwest 39th, Northwest 40th, and also Barnes, and each of those streets is gonna receive new on-street parking these are items that we had to forward to the traffic commission um, for their approval and recommendation to you as the council that's going to create new 90 degree parking, new 45 degree angle parking, new 45 degree reverse angle parking, and then also establish the ADA accessible spaces for the district. And so each of the six items addresses either one of those streets or one of those different parking configurations. The 39th Street streetscapes under construction um, it's going well. Um, we are expecting a completion later this summer, early fall. I'm in time for hopefully some celebrations later this year. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm very, I, as I've said from the beginning, very excited about this project. Um, I, uh, I'll take them in reverse order. I'm very excited, especially about the, um, the ADA accessibility. I just think that is a wonderful focus for us. I know many of our street enhancement projects are prioritizing um, ADA accessibility, and I'm very much looking forward to all of our residents um, feeling welcome in, in the new infrastructure improvements coming to our historic 39th Street District. Uh, the reverse angle parking, or do we have any other examples across our state of that? Councilman, I believe there probably are other cities um, that are starting to also pilot these projects. I believe there's maybe some that's in the Tulsa uh, downtown area, um, but mm -hmm. this will be one of the first for Oklahoma City to do as official reverse angle parking. It's a part of one of the Oklahoma City streetscapes. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone knows my preference for tier one protected bike lanes or tier two protected bike lanes. Not everyone shares my perspective. And uh, I remember well over a year ago, pre-pandemic, um, the sort of compromise options were a multi-use trail or path or uh, these, these reverse angle um, parking spaces, which I had not heard of um, until they were presented to me. And I, I was then presented to the board and, and um, I went to go teach. And next thing I know, voila, there they are. So um, sometimes compromise is a good thing. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, these improvements. And so with that, I just want to, again, um, so I don't know how many more times any items from this district is going to come before our council related to the project. So if this is the end, I would just want to say to uh, Eric and Kim Cooper Hart and Jeff and our consultants and the community, the board of 39th, like, thank you for all of your work to make this possible. And with that, I would move for approval. This is item O. Yes, right. item O. Yeah, we'll do, do that's a item O. Series, just the final. series of these in the same in the same area. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Are we able to get it up? 
Endor, has anyone signed up to speak also? No, we had no one sign up on any of the items. Thank you, Mayor. Here we go. I moved it, but the internet, okay, there we go. All right, we have a motion and a second on item O, cast your votes. Councilman Stone, are you there? I, I am here. Are you able to vote? Yes. Okay, I still can't see it. All right, passed unanimously. All right, item P. Uh, and the, as I said, the next several of these will be in the same area and on the same topic Councilman Cooper was just addressing. But item P is an ordinance on final hearing establishing 45 degree angle parking within an on-street parking area on the east side of Northwest 40th Street, et cetera, Councilman Cooper. Um, yeah, I'll move approval as soon as the screen promotes. Okay. All right, we got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, item Q, ordinance on final hearing establishing 45 degree reverse angle parking within on street parking areas on the south side of Northwest 39th at various locations. Councilman Cooper. Uh, move for approval when the opportunity arises. Motion in a second, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Item R, ordinance on final hearing establishing 45 degree reverse angle parking within on street parking areas on the north side of Northwest 39th at various locations. Councilman Cooper. I'll move for approval when the screen says so. Motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item S, ordinance on final hearing establishing reserved parking spaces for the physically disabled on the north side of Northwest 39th at various locations, Councilman Cooper. Yes, um, I would, yeah. This really means a lot to me. I'll, I'll moving for approval, please. Okay. There we go. Motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9T is an ordinance on final hearing, establishing reserved parking spaces for the physically disabled on the south side of Northwest 39th Street at various locations. Councilman Cooper. Uh, so, okay, this is it. Move approval. <laughs> All right, we've got a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now, am I correct that we did item U and item B already, but so we're on item W? Okay. Item W, this is an ordinance on final hearing, establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled within a setback area on the east side of North Brookline Avenue, uh, et cetera. Councilwoman Hammond. I will move for approval when it is available. Got a motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item X, this is an ordinance on final hearing establishing metered parking on the north and south sides of West Oklahoma City Boulevard between South Walker Avenue and Thunder Drive slash South Robinson. Councilwoman Hammond. 
Yeah, so this is, um, yeah, getting meters up on the, the parking that's along the boulevard there. So I will move for approval when it's available. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9Y, ordinance on final hearing establishing reserved parking spaces for the physically disabled on the south side of West Oklahoma City Boulevard between South Walker and Thunder Drive slash South Robinson at various locations. Councilwoman Hammond. Move for approval. Second. Second. Councilwoman Hammond. Move for approval. Second. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item Z, ordinance on final hearing establishing reserved parking spaces for the physically disabled on the north side of West Oklahoma City Boulevard between South Walker and Thunder Drive, South Robinson Avenue at various locations. Councilwoman Hammond. I will move for approval again. A motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item nine, double A. This is an ordinance on final hearing. This is the third meeting where we are considering this potential ordinance change. It relates to false alarms. You may recall a presentation two meetings ago, and then we had a public hearing at our last meeting, and today is potential final consideration and adoption of the ordinance, if that is what the council chooses to do. So if the council wishes to make a motion, you could go that direction. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, the next series of items relate to the selling of bonds. And are we in a position to do those now? We're ready to go. Okay. All right. Item A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E. Um, I think you have presentations on this. So I'll yes. turn it over to you, Mr. City Manager. So Brent Bryant is with us, our finance director, to uh, just give us an update on this sale. Uh, we actually have the bids in, have the information available. It's posted online. Um, and I'll let Brent take it over and tell us uh, what we got in our bids. He looks like he's... Can you hear him? He's talking, but we can't hear him. Brent, yeah, Brent, we're not able to hear you. We're not picking up audio on you. Looks like you're unmuted, but we're not picking up the audio. Nope, still can't hear you. I tell you what, why don't we, so, yeah, move past these items, go to the next items. So that would mean skipping all the way to a view? Yes. All right, we'll, we'll, and then we'll see if we can get him fixed we'll get here. Okay, we're going to move to AG and come back as soon as Brent is uh, on a device that's picking up his audio. All right, AG, this is a um, second of three meetings. You may recall this was the uh, discussion of, of uh, modifying references to the EAT uh, Environmental Assistance Trust in our ordinances as we consolidate that uh, entity. And so this is the second of three meetings. It is the public hearing regarding this ordinance relating to solid waste amending Chapter 49 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code, et cetera. Uh, Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No, Mayor, no one's signed up. Okay. Well, we will then close that public hearing and we'll move on to another public hearing, item AH. Uh, this is AH1 is the public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures here listed, except for those struck at the beginning of the meeting. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No, Mayor, no one's signed up. All right. Well, then that brings us to item AH2, which is the resolution declaring that the structures are dilapidated. If the, matter, if the council wishes to adopt that, we can take that motion now.
We've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Councilman McAtee, can you cast your vote, please? Alternatively, uh, Larry, we could take your vote verbally if you just want to say it. You're having trouble. There we go. All right, passes unanimously. Item 9 AI 1 is the public hearing regarding these unsecured structures here listed, except for those struck at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No, Mayor. No one's signed up. All right, well, then we will look towards. Uh, AI2, which is the resolution declaring that the structures are unsecured. And if the council wishes to make a motion, we will consider that resolution. And we've got a motion in a second. Is there any? Okay. I plunge through abandoned and then we'll go back to it. Okay, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then item nine. AJ1 is a public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed, except for those struck at the beginning of the meeting. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under, under this public hearing? No one has signed up to speak. Then we will look at the resolution at AJ2 declaring that the buildings are abandoned. What does the council wish to do? Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we will rewind to item A, B and have a discussion about bond sales again. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, great. Okay, well, uh, like I previously said, uh, today has been a great day for the taxpayers of Oklahoma City as we believe we had some of the lowest interest rates that we've ever had on our general obligation bonds. And so um, today we received on our uh, tax, ex tax exempt uh, bonds, we received seven uh, bids and the low with the lowest one coming from JP Morgan Securities LLC with the true interest cost of 1.935627. Um, so staff recommends that we uh, award these the 116.6 million general obligation bonds uh, series 2021 to JP Morgan Securities LLC at a true interest cost again at 1.935627. I would like to add that um, all the documents that were originally provided to you have been redlined and they've been added to the city's website. So if you'll go out to okc.gov uh, slash debt, all of the uh, adjusted uh, uh, updated documents have been adjusted for your review. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Brent. That's really great news. So I just want to point out that when we get to the ordinances on each one of them, we do need the emergency on both the ordinances. Okay. So we'll begin right with AB, award purchase of the $116,600,000 City of Oklahoma City General Obligation Bond Series 2021 to the bidder whose bid is determined to offer the lowest true interest cost. You just heard uh, of that. And so would entertain a motion to um, award purchase. We've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we're on we item. A, do we need an emergency with that or not? Uh, no, because it's not an ordinance. It's uh, just a word purchase. We'll get to that on this next item and the item two up. Okay, so AC is an ordinance on final hearing providing for the issuance of general obligation bonds in the sum of $116,600,000 by the city of Oklahoma City, et cetera. We'll take a motion on that and then we'll have a separate motion uh, adopting, potentially adopting an emergency. 
Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now, is there a motion to adopt the emergency on that ordinance? I move the emergency to the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Let's do that virtually as well. So this is the emergency on item AC, 9AC. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 9AD is an award purchase of $30 million in City of Oklahoma City General Obligation Limited Tax Bonds Taxable Series 2021 to the bidder whose bid is determined to offer the lowest true interest cost. And you heard a little bit about that again a moment ago from Brent. Yes, so sir. So we would take a yes, sir. motion. Uh, yes, sir. Oh. On, this, on this one, Mayor, we received nine bids on the taxable bond series. Uh, and uh, Robert W. Baird and Company was a low bidder with a true interest cost of 2.102304. Uh, so staff recommends a $30 million of general obligation limited tax bonds taxable series 2021 be sold to Robert W. Baird and Company at a true interest rates cost of 2.102304. And again, the, the uh, updated documents related to this transaction are um, located out on www.okc.gov slash debt along with the updated ordinance that you'll be looking at on the next item. So I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, you heard the explanation. So is there a motion for the award purchase? When we have that opportunity. Okay. There you go. We've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. And then item 9AE is an ordinance on final hearing providing for the issuance of general obligation limited tax bonds in the sum of $30 million by the city of Oklahoma City, uh, et cetera. And you heard a little bit about that, and this relates obviously to the award purchase we just made. We'll consider adoption of this and then consider an emergency as well. So is there a motion on the adoption of the ordinance? Um, motion in a second, cast your vote. Passes unanimously. And then the emergency for that ordinance. If someone would care to make a motion when you have that opportunity. I'd move the ordinance with an emergency when it comes All right. up. Thank you. Motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, uh, AF, item nine, AF one and two are related to each other. The first is a public hearing, but why don't we hear a little bit um, about this before we uh, before we open that public hearing. This is this whole topic is regarding the refunding of certain outstanding portions of the city's general obligation bond series 2011 issued in the original principal amount of $43 million for interest cost savings. Mr. City Manager. Yes, Brent Bryan, our finance director is here again to uh, speak to us about this item. Like the mayor said, this is a refunding of outstanding bonds. Um, so it's like a refinancing basically. And Brent, we'll let Brent just give a quick description of this item and the timing of the expected sale. Yes, thank you, City, Mr. City Manager. Um, in 2011, the city uh, authorized issuance of, six, of $43 million. To, as of right now, we have about $22.6 million of those funds are outstanding. 
And per our typical bond issue, we had a call feature where we could call the bonds after 10 years. And so what we're looking for our debt policy, we can, we will, we would refinance these debt, these bonds, uh, as long as we had a 3% minimum sa uh, present value savings. Uh, we're anticipating a present value savings of a little over 16% on these as, as bond rates as you could, as you just saw on the, on the previous two items are extremely low. So uh, we're looking here today to get your authorization to uh, issue or to, to have a negotiated sale, which we will have in late uh, or mid middle to late April. With that, I'm happy to end. What, one thing where I would like to point out, um, our debt staff with uh, Angela Pierce and Mike Baskin have worked tirelessly today and previous for the last month and a half getting this together. And I just want to uh, just recognize them and let them know I appreciate their hard work along with our our, our bond council, uh, Williams Box Forshe and John Michael Williams and Jared Davidson, and then PFM, our municipal advisor. So I just want to recognize them for their diligence on all of our debt today. Brent, this all is Dave right. Greenwell. I hate to delay this, but you mentioned we had a 16% reduction in interest rates. But no, what, what we anticipate is our present value savings, looking at what we would pay in debt if we if we did not refund these bonds to what if we do refund them um, our our debt policy requires us to have a minimum of three percent savings um, overall and we're actually going to have a estimated about 16 over 16 percent so it's not yeah can you just give me a rough estimate of what the current interest rates on those bonds are um, don't have that on me but I will get that in just a second. It just of an interest to me only. Thank you. Okay. I'll move into the public hearing now. Item 9 AF1 is a public hearing regarding the refunding of certain outstanding portions of the city's general obligation bond series 2011 issued in the original principal amount of $43 million for interest cost savings. Amy, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No one has signed up to speak. Okay. Mayor, so can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead. Mayor. Yep. Hey, oh. The sixteen percent savings is that calculated over the entire forty-three million or the uh, balance that's left? It would be based on the balance that's left, which was twenty-two. Twenty-two million. Correct? A little over okay. twenty-two. Twenty-two point six million. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing now and move on to AF2, uh, resolution providing for the sale and issuance of general obligation refunding bonds in the amount not to exceed $25 million by the city of Oklahoma City uh, for the purpose of refunding certain outstanding general obligation bonds, including portions of the city's general obligation bond series 2011, uh, et cetera. And I say et cetera, because nobody told me I had to read all of that, but right. there's no legal obligation. Okay, very good. <laughs> So uh, with that, we would uh, entertain a motion to adopt that resolution. And this does require uh, six affirmative votes to incur indebtedness, seven affirmative votes to waive competitive bidding. First, the motion. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Resolution is adopted and with the with eight votes, more than enough to incur indebtedness and waive competitive bidding. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, I have an answer for Mr. Greenwell. The uh, average is 4.13% on those bonds, and we anticipate borrowing money around 1%. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes all the bond work. And we are now going to jump back. Uh, we'd already done uh, the, several of these items uh, that lie ahead. We're now at actually at item AK. This is a resolution amending the coronavirus relief funds plan and the subcategory allocations contained therein. Item AL is also related to coronavirus. And so I believe we have a presentation on both items. Mr. City Manager. 
Yes, sir. Kenny Sula, our assistant city manager, is on to um, speak to these items. One amends the plan to allow for us to make this adjustment that's going to be considered on item AL. So I'll let Kenny go ahead and make the presentation and speak to both of these items. Thank you, city manager. Uh, Kenny Sudol, assistant city manager. Um, on the two items, item AK is to amend the coronavirus relief funds plan. So just as a quick reminder, uh, the city received over $114 million of coronavirus relief funds that were part of the CARES Act back in April of 2020. There was a plan, a preliminary plan adopted in May. Um, and then on June 16th, council adopted a more detailed plan as you recall, we've amended this plan five times, and this item would be the sixth amendment, just responding to various programs and things contained what therein. And this amendment before you today, the main change is within the testing and tracing category. And we would, uh, staff is asking to reallocate $1,047,000 from the reserve for increased COVID-19 response subcategory to the public health emergency recovery planning and research subcategory. And basically to kind of, there's a lot of words, but it's officially what it's called in the plan. But it, as, you, as you recall, we had had some money set aside within testing and tracing that the majority of that went to fund some uh, testing and vaccinations and things that uh, uh, work that went through city county health, but we had some money held back in a reserve and uh, what we'd like to do is uh, use this, these, move these funds to provide for the continuation of the sewage monitoring program. So there's some other minor changes uh, in the plan as well. Uh, one of those is increasing uh, some allowable funding for a minority small business economic recovery and resiliency plan. This is something that was uh, approved previously. We took some bids and the bids came in just a little bit above what we had in there. So it's increasing that. Uh, from 250,000 to 310,000, uh, updating the plan to, to reflect the new deadline of December 30th, 2021, and cleaning up some irrelevant language. You know, we had talked early on about if, if a vaccine became available, et cetera. So it's just kind of changing some of that language. Um, the second item, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about AL. So, so AK is the plan making the allocation. AL is the actual agreement with the University of Oklahoma for the sewage monitoring program. And just to kind of uh, give you an update on, on that, um, back in September 29th, 2020, council entered into an agreement with the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation to provide this coronavirus planning and research program. And that was really what we, you know, that was the formal name of our sewage monitoring program. And at the time, as you recall, there were several research projects and other things that we ran through OMRF uh, and, and the sewage monitoring program was one of those. The team consisted of people from the University of Oklahoma, OU Health Science Center, OU Medical, and, and this project was to draw and monitor sewage samples from various sites around Oklahoma City and test those for the prevalence of COVID-19, not only just seeing if it's there, but how much is in the samples. And originally it was, it was funded with the CARES Act with the coronavirus relief funds. And it was originally uh, set to expire that first contract in December of 2020. So today's agreement on AL is directly with the University of Oklahoma as opposed to OMRF, but it's the same team. And <clears throat> this agreement would allow us to continue this from Jan kind of backing up to January uh, 2021 until December of 2021 to kind of coincide with the new CARES Act deadline. And it would be funded with those coronavirus relief funds uh, if you approve item AL. Um, so under this agreement, just a couple things, samples would be drawn and tested from uh, four of our sewage treatment facilities. And then in addition, we have 14 other sampling sites that have been set up. And these are the sites we've been testing, uh, you know, that some of the information that City County Health uh, referred to earlier in the meeting. And uh, under this agreement, we would test those a minimum of twice a week. And in addition to this, one of the new things that also we talked about earlier is this would also, in this new contract, uh, provide for testing four times a month on samples for the various strains. And that's known as sequencing testing. So uh, in addition to just looking 
is COVID there? We're also now this, this agreement would provide for looking at the sequencing. Um, again, this information is what we use and, and you know, it's, primary, it's used by the city, but also shared with city county health as, as they mentioned earlier about, you know, using it to make decisions, identify hotspots, looking at levels of virus and it just helps inform those testing and vaccination efforts. And, you know, even, even later on, you know, potentially could help us uh, look at, um, you know, some of the uh, effectiveness of uh, some of those efforts. So uh, with that, that's a quick overview. Uh, they'll be providing us reports. Uh, we'll be happy to come back and, you know, share some of this data with you as well. Uh, be happy to take any questions on either item AK or AL. Kenny, I just wanted to say, because uh, I don't, I, I just think it's always worth saying to you, thank you for navigating just sort of this endless, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, barrage of, of um, I don't know, bureaucracy. Uh, I, I was just applauding you the other day to somebody for your, your work. Um, also, before you get too happy about that, I was applauding you and also they were asking questions. They were like, I have questions about CARES Act. It's like, oh, go talk to Kenny. So <laughs> be ready, they're coming for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, my, my next question is, um, well, that was a comment, question. Have we heard anything yet about uh, the, the American Recovery Act in the Congress passed um, in terms of, um, the funds that are going to be able to supplement some of the work we've already set in motion and or, for instance, the stuff that the funds that Mayor Holt and those of us who supported last year's resolution for the um, municipal revenue. What, or, do we have any updates on that? Sure. So it's my understanding, you know, that passed and I can't remember the exact date that it was signed in, but I believe it was around, you know, the middle of March, like the 14th or 15th. And I believe under the bill, they're supposed to begin dispersing the funds 30 days from that date. However, we have not gotten any information yet. We're still awaiting guidance from Treasury. And usually the signal is there's something that uh, the mayor has to sign. Uh, that's what's happened on the last two things. So I really kind of already expected that to have happened this week, but I bet it's just imminent. And as soon as that happens, uh, you know, we will do all the steps necessary to make sure we receive our allocation. Um, the, the guidance, it, it'll be similar to the CARES Act that, you know, the, the law had some broad language in it and then the Treasury Department of the United States will be the agency that's putting forward all the guidance and things. But just to kind of speak to a couple of things you alluded to there, yes, um, there are provisions uh, in that funding to help with revenue replacement, the devil's in the details. So we're still analyzing that and waiting on guidance to see exactly how we can use that. And yes, some of these COVID mitigation efforts, both, both the actual efforts on things like um, city county health efforts, testing vaccinations, we believe that there will be the ability to do that as well as potentially economic um, assistance for for, uh, you know, similar to what we did in the CARES Act. However, you know, I would caution that there's a lot of stuff in that bill, even beyond what we're going to receive. And that's really um, something we're having to look at um, is, A, what's the guidance and the allowable use is going to be? And then B, what else did that bill provide? Because there's so much in trying to make sure we don't duplicate and things like that. So I know that's a long way for me to say, stay tuned. You know, we're still working on, uh, uh, getting that information and treasury just hasn't put it out yet. Well, Godspeed and good luck. And I look forward to the, the updates. So thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, we can uh, proceed with adopting the resolutions. We're at item 9AK, resolution amending the coronavirus relief funds plan and the subcategory allocations contained therein. And we've got the screen up for a potential motion. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes.
Are we waiting on anybody in particular? Amy, do you know? Lynn McAtee, how do you vote? Councilwoman Hammond. I'm not, is she still present? I'm not seeing her. All right, we're gonna move on. Okay, passes unanimously. Um, all right, we've got item now AL still on this topic. This is a resolution approving the coronavirus relief planning and research program agreement with the University of Oklahoma as just described uh, in an amount not to exceed a million dollars, a million forty-seven thousand um, dollars retroactive to January 1st. Is there a motion? Oh, okay. Probably have time to come back. All right, got a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to item 9 a.m. This is a resolution approving a request by the Oklahoma City Park Commission to name the park path in South Lakes Park the Ray Thompson Walking and Jogging Trail in honor of Ray Thompson, former Oklahoma City Park Commissioner, Game and Fish Commissioner, and Civic Volunteer. Councilman McAtee has stepped away, I understand, and this is in his ward, but uh, I guess we do have a presentation from Doug, right? Or yes. I mean, at least a few words. Yes, yes Doug Cupper just gives a couple of words to uh, describe this item. Thank you, Mayor, uh, City Manager Freeman. Doug Cupper, Parks and Recreation Director for the record. Uh, Ray Thompson uh, was a, uh, uh, he was a historic figure in the, on the south side of town. He was principal at, at Capitol Hill High School for a long, long time, was a teacher there. Uh, when he retired from the school district, uh, he uh, continued to work for the community. And as part of that, he actually served for 12 years on the uh, Oklahoma City's Fish and Game Commission. And after he left that, he was appointed to the Board of Park Commissioners for 17 years. So he had he had 29 years of, of volunteer work in helping to guide a lot of the activities that the uh, Parks and Recreation Department still holds dear uh, today. He, uh, he was a stalwart uh, in protecting the park system and bringing forth issues and, and concerns at every park board meeting. And he was an avid user of the parks and specifically, he loved the walking path at South Lakes Park. And that's why the uh, Board of Park Commissioners are recommending to the City Council that the walking trail at South Lakes Park be named for Ray Thompson. Be happy to answer any questions. Doug, this is David Greenwell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I would just like to say a few additional words, especially since Councilman McAtee's not well, uh, Mr. Thompson is the uh, prime example of an individual that is uh, dedicated to making the community a better place to live. He uh, was in education for over 30 years as a teacher, counselor, principal, uh, and uh, uh, served some of the schools that uh, I attended. And uh, he, uh, some of those students needed a little bit more counseling than others. <laughs> A, uh, a great leader. And not only that, he uh, got involved in refereeing and he would certainly control uh, uh, some of those basketball games as well as football games. And he went beyond just refereeing in high school. He, uh, I know for a while he was refereeing what I refer to as semi-pro football here in Oklahoma City, the old Oklahoma City Wranglers. And any person brave enough to referee those types of games is is a, a strong uh, individual because those guys know how to get out of hand real quickly. Uh, but you're right, he is very concerned about the parks throughout the city. And uh, he only missed three meetings 
over 30 years. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And it speaks so highly of his dedication to the city and trying to make it a better place. And so I, I certainly agree with this uh, decision and uh, I count Mr. Thompson as a close friend. And I used to see him a lot out at the early wine uh, trail, but he's moved on to a, a little bit larger trail over there at South, South Lake. So uh, I wish him well, and it's always great to see him. And I know he is very excited about this opportunity and so are very many other people uh, who know Ray. So thank you very much for bringing that before us. All right. Well, with that, we could uh, take a motion to adopt the resolution. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passage unanimously. Now we're at item 9AN. This is one of the funnest items I'll ever vote on for the greatest city staff in the United States of America. This is a resolution authorizing the city manager to issue all current full-time and part-time city employees a one-time stipend in recognition of extraordinary work performed during fiscal year 2020, 2021. It has indeed been a unique year and our nearly 5,000 city employees have been on the front lines of something our community had not experienced in a century. And if you can't tell which way I'm leaning on this vote, I will turn it now over to the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your comments. Um, I agree. This is uh, an item I'm really grateful that we're able to do this. I'm grateful to the city leadership bringing this forward as a proposal and then the council support on this is something we're in this together uh, to make this proposal uh, to move forward for the uh, city employees to show all of you um, our appreciation for your efforts. And, and I really wanna speak directly to the employees that you know, going through this past year uh, with COVID, it, it created so many situations where there was just so much uncertainty about just the, the health risks that we had. Uh, we had the financial challenges that we had to cut back, which put even more pressure on employees. And uh, we had people in quarantine either because of contracting COVID or being exposed to COVID. Um, all those things together put more and more pressure on our employees. And they just continued to, to step up and continue to fight and continue to work. There were times they were frustrated, I know, as we were putting different uh, regulations in place for safety and health. Uh, some didn't feel like we put enough in place or just a lot of uncertainty and i appreciate everyone continuing to work through that and even in their frustration um and the and the um stress that this brought on to continue to work hard to try to provide the best services that we can to our residents i know that the budget cuts that we've made and some of the challenges we've had with COVID have put a stress on our services and put us in a place where it was more difficult to provide services at the level that we're used to providing but i know our employees have continued to work very hard uh, to do a great job and I just appreciate the work they do. I think you add on top of that, the unusual winter we had that that was generally mild, but then at the very end of the fall, you know, late fall, we have an ice storm that was unprecedented and it created a lot of, uh, of pressure on uh, getting the debris cleaned up, whether it was on, you know, for residents or it was in parks or along rights of way. And so there's a extreme event there. And then the weather that we had that required our road crews to be out there clearing the roads for us. And, and, um, and then we had the extreme weather late in the winter that was again, unprecedented uh, weather with the temperatures that we had that again, put us in a position of not being able to serve our residents the way we're used to, uh, but it put all of our employees in a position, whether they were responding to a water line break or a resident having issues of water at their house or clearing the roadway or responding to emergencies all of our employees were put into positions where they were having to serve in really difficult and dangerous um, conditions. And they just continued to work hard and stay at it and work extra hours. And uh, we just want to be able to express our appreciation to our employees through this one-time stipend. I would say that just financially, if you look at it, that because of where we are, and we got a sales tax report on today, but because, because of where we are with uh, sales tax, our revenues are below where we were last year but they're still above what we had projected by a good amount. 
In addition, uh, the departments have done a great job managing their budgets and we're, we're well below our budget on expenditures. So it puts us in a good position to be able to do this. And in addition to that, we have the CARES Act funds that are available to reimburse the city for uh, public safety expenses. So we have that available. So all of those conditions together put us in a good position to be able to do this and make it a good financial decision. But really more than that, it's a better decision to show our employees how much we appreciate them. And uh, to directly again to our employees, I just say thank you for the great work that you've done. We wanna continue that effort of always continue to look at ways that we can improve. Um, and I know that you all are doing that every day, but I just wanna say thank you for the great work that you've done in, in very trying times. And so thank you all and uh, council, I appreciate your support with this. All right, thank you, Craig. And thank you to our city team. And we're glad we have the resources to do this. And if there's no other hey, comments Mayor, or questions. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanna say that uh, I love that we are able to bring this forward and appreciate Craig, all your hard work in that. Um, and I think it means a lot to be able to, to do that for our employees. And I really am appreciative of all that they do every day. Um, and I just wanted to verify this is exempt from uh, elected officials, correct? Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's, and I'm glad you asked that out loud, even though all of us probably knew the answer. Of course, our salary is set by the charter and cannot be adjusted without a vote of the people, which is not about to occur. So. Thank you, Todd. All right, with that, if there's no other comments or questions, we could uh, take a motion on this resolution. A motion in a second, cast your votes. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. Okay, I have got to step away. I'm gonna turn it over to Vice Mayor Greenwell. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, I believe we uh, have one more item. Uh, item A01. Resolution to uh, request the salary continuation for Corporal Matthew Alberti. And uh, while he continues his rehabilitation to recover from on the job injury for additional six months or until March 18th, 2022, whichever should occur first. And the effective date would be March 19th, 2021 of this uh, resolution. And do we motion? I will make a motion. Thank you. And we will now vote. And it's approved uh, unanimously. Thank you. Next, we have claims recommended for approval. Item XA1, we have one item there. I will accept a motion, please. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded, we'll vote. Thank you, okay. Next, items from council. We've gone over item uh, A, ordinance uh, pertaining to the mask requirement. So we will now hear from the various council members. I believe James, uh, Councilman Griner has left. So Councilman Cooper. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll try and be as quick as possible. One, thank you to everybody who attended last Wednesday's vigil in our historic Asian district uh, to speak out, of course, uh, against um, the dramatic increase we've seen since the start of the pandemic uh, as in regards to, um, you know, um, hate crimes related to our Asian American um, family. 
uh, at, at the last council meeting, if you remember, before that, uh, those murders in Atlanta, I actually, I made a comment cautioning us and um, saying I was very concerned. And then that day didn't end without that, those murders um, and the loss of life we saw in Atlanta. And that's very haunting to me. Um, but I, our, our Asian district, um, if you can go watch KOCO, they did it live. They, they streamed it live and you, you'll get to hear from our first state representative who is, um, uh, who's Asian. She spoke, uh, multiple people spoke and it was just very moving, arguably cathartic. And um, I am honored to represent all of Ward 2 and definitely our historic Asian district. So again, thank you, um, I believe Mayor Holt. Well, of course, he spoke. So I don't even, it's not that I believe it, he just spoke. And I really appreciated that as well. And again, all the elected officials, all of our community leaders who attended. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Positive Tomorrows for taking uh, Councilwoman uh, Joe Beth Hammond and I on a tour of, um, of their facility. Um, it was kind of a, it was, it was a sobering reminder that 6,000 children in our city are experiencing homelessness. And that's not just limited to the OKCPS schools. In fact, we're seeing worryingly high numbers in our Putnam City School Districts too. These are all of our children, regardless of the school district they're, they call OKC home. And so um, I call them our children, um, but I'm very impressed and very proud of the people at Positive uh, Tomorrow's for the, the work uh, they are doing. Um, I also wanted to say uh, thank you to Embark who hosted two town halls on our Northwest BRT. Um, those are gonna be uh, available streaming online. So I would encourage you if you missed those check them out. Um, and I, um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say there. Uh, also wanted to say thank you to Pivot for taking me on a tour of their facilities. Again, um, it's wonderful seeing folks step up and make sure we're offering a support system to our, to our kids. Um, so many of them, as you all know, are facing, um, you know, uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and um, it might seem easy to under rug swept these sorts of difficult conversations, but we can't, we mustn't. And it's encouraging when we see people uh, at Pivot and uh, Positive Tomorrows um, and other folk all across our city stepping up um, and realizing that those who are experiencing homelessness are, are our neighbors. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to say thank you to that. And then finally, um, I celebrate my 39th birthday on April Fool's Day this week. And I could never have guessed the best gift anyone could ever have given me was this past Sunday when my mother, um, as I mentioned earlier, age 77, came over to my house. We're both fully vaccinated. <laughs> And we got to hug for the first time in a year. And um, just means the world to me um, that we both uh, endured this pandemic. I am hyper conscious of the over 500,000 Americans we've lost to this, um, this, this uh, historic pandemic. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful I got to hug my mom this past weekend um, with lilacs and trees behind us. It was a wonderful moment. So, um, and when we were out and about, we ran into Councilwoman Nice. <laughs> so that was cool. So anyway, just wanted to say, uh, love you mom. And I, I hope that more moms and family members find themselves vaccinated in the weeks ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I believe Councilman McAtee is not with us. So, uh, Councilman Stone. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I think I'm good for the day. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilperson Hammond. She's no longer on the meeting. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, Councilperson Nice. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Vice Mayor. I do wanna say congratulations and thank you to all of our, our extended family. Uh, that's what I call them, our, our folks that work for the city. So thank you so much for all that you do. And this was a no brainer for us to say, thank you for your efforts uh, because we personally have called some of you to ask if you could help us with certain things and you've been able to do that pertaining to our residents, of course. Anything pertaining to our residents, um, our city staff has not hesitated to assist us in efforts of at least uh, trying to work through a resolve or solution. So again, this is very exciting and the part that it's not limited. So it's for everyone, I think is the best part about that. Um, and I do wanna say, continue to say thank you to the Oklahoma City County Health Department, also to uh, OU Health, as well as Guiding Right um, and uh, Centennial Health and Community Centers of Oklahoma uh, for all of their efforts in, in us working through the process to ensure that our communities can get the vaccination. Um, it's just unfortunate. It's as soon as I kind of get the information and post it, it's already obsolete. So um, it's really difficult to get a lot of that information in our communities in a more timely manner, but we're gonna continue to work through the process. Again, equity is always at the forefront. Uh, for my conversations uh, pertaining to testing and vaccinations. Um, on the, the eve, we have the eve of the last day of Women's History Month. I do want to say some great news has been released, if you had not heard. Uh, the Brockway Center has officially been place on the National Register of Historic Places. So this is so beautiful for us to honor the, the women um, and their efforts. And uh, to that point, the Oklahoma Federation of Colored Women's Clubs turned 110 this year, just the organization itself. Uh, so congratulations to the ladies and uh, just generations of, of women um, that have been at the forefront of fighting uh, for equality and, and fighting for women. Uh, per se, to, to be a part of what is happening in, in our society and in our many communities that are throughout Oklahoma. Um, I know one of the things I just want us to, again, as we get, we get in the area of Easter coming with Palm, uh, um, we just had Palm Sunday, but with Good Friday and Easter coming, um, I've been seeing, you know, a lot of churches and organizations that are ready to open their doors wide as if we're not still in a pandemic. So I just want to caution, caution us to continue to uh, social distance, wash our hands and um, do the things that we need to do uh, to cover our faces as far as making sure we're protecting ourselves and, and protecting our, our fellow neighbors and those that we go to church with and, and help them those that need to get signed up for a vaccination that we're able to do that. Um, a couple other things I wanted to mention. I wanna say a thank you to our friends at Martin Nature Park Center. Um, this past Saturday, I participated in a night hike and it was so much fun. Got to see, uh, well, we tried to see some owls, but we, we missed out on a few of them. They just didn't want to come out to party with us that night on Saturday night. But uh, just being there, and that was my first time actually going to the to the park on the trail. So it was really exciting. So kudos to the staff at Martin Nature Park Center uh, for uh, guiding us on that, that hike. It started at 7, a little after 7, and we ended about 8.30. So we got to see the moon and it's a full bloom and, and setting and, and just seeing deer and birds and uh, just the beauty of, of our city in that area. So thank you so much for the accommodations there. Um, and it, to want to say, oh, a couple, one more, two more things are, I want to say thank you to all of our human rights task force members 
We made some history this past Thursday, um, including our fellow council members uh, who were also a part of that vote. We did say yes to recommending to our city council to reestablish the Human Rights Commission. So that was a historic vote for us. And uh, thank you to all who have uh, continuously been a part of this process. Although we're not completely finished, this is what we've been working towards to get to uh, this area where we can say we wanna move forward and recommend it to our council. Now we have to work through more of the framework. So uh, congratulations to our task force for their efforts. And also I wanna say thank you to our co-chairs, uh, Mariana Adams and Dr. Andrea Benjamin for their hard work um, in helping us get to this effort as well. And obviously our staff, our um, municipal uh, council that were a part of this process and are continuing to work through us through this process. And uh, Ms. Jane Abraham and Sharita Bryce for all that you have done to help us in this effort too. Thank you so much. And Jared and Ms. Rita from our municipal council, thank you so much to you all as well and other city staff that we've asked to come in and maybe present or talk with us. Last but not least, I uh, wanna say uh, that we're gonna have a grand opening this weekend for Kindred Spirits. If you have not seen the East Point uh, area, the project, as far as that development, we welcome you to come and, and support business in the community. It is uh, obviously over 50%. We're still working on the occupancy to make it 100%, but over 50% Black businesses and over 50% of those Black businesses are women. Uh, with this effort, again, this is going to be a new spot as far as our community to, to have a place to gather and, and just enjoy the beauty of Northeast Oklahoma City. So we're excited about that. Um, and I know I have talked to our, our mayor about this. So I wanna to continue to work through this, uh, establishing a neighborhood conservation committee, reestablishing the neighborhood conservation committee for our city council um, and uh, for us to continue to work through those efforts and uh, before I finish, I just remembered one more thing and then I'll be done, I'm sorry. But I, I want to work through this micro grant uh, program that we've been talking about. And it's very unfortunate um, as I, I, I did get a list of those who, were, who received the grant. Um, however, when I get my updates every other week, um, I had been looking to, to see how we could work through uh, getting more people to apply and getting uh, services and help or that technical type of assistance for some of our businesses also in the urban renewal area. However, um, I find out that it closed on the 15th, which was uh, never never presented to me in the information that I had received. So now there's no way to be able to help those folks uh, that we know still need some assistance through this effort. So I'm hoping we can work uh, to look at other options and opportunities for our communities pertaining to uh, their businesses and seeking assistance for them as well. So I will leave with that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilman Stone Cypher. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I wanna give a special thanks to Hi Hartwig and his company Total Environmental. Uh, they reached out to uh, Doug Cupper and his staff. Uh, they had some concerns about the uh, Lone Oak tree, which is gonna be the focal point of the new Lone Oak Park. As you remember, uh, this is a tree that's been around 100, 150 plus years. And uh, they went out as a volunteer and, uh, and pruned it and took care of it and it looks great and so uh, thank you, Ty, Ty Hartwig, and thank you, Total Environmental. The other reason I mentioned that is I also want to thank uh, Doug Cupper and his staff. Uh, on May the 4th, we are going to have a neighborhood meeting uh, where we begin to discuss the design of the park. And so that will come out soon in publications and uh, be placed on OKC.gov May the 4th. Uh, we're going to start looking at designs for the new park. And uh, the last thing, again, uh, Larry McAtee and James Griner, it has been an honor and a privilege to serve with you. You will be missed. God bless. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to turn this over to Councilman Stone. So Councilman Stone, would you please take over from this point and 
we'll be moving into the city manager's report. Will do. Uh, Mr. You. City Manager. Yes, sir. Thank you. We have Mike Knopp with us today um, from River Sport Foundation to be able to give us an update, the quarterly update on the uh, River Sport um, area and the uh, activities going on there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Freeman. I, I'm going to share my screen. I had so I for my presentation here. I'm going to give that a try. Okay. All right. Well. Thank you for having me this uh, this afternoon, and I, I'm going to get right into it um, with our financial update. I have Mike Ming also here available if there's any questions. Mike is the chairman of the River Sport Foundation Board of Directors. Um, but uh, to begin, we're, we're looking forward to a great year with the weather improving and, and certainly um, having gone through the, uh, the COVID situation over the last year, we do believe people want to be outside and that's something that is in our wheelhouse. So I think you'll see that as we go through the presentation, um, how we are going to be accommodating people through this year in many different ways. And, and, uh, and we're really excited, excited about that. But anyway, so through February, we were actually, our total income was about 8% less than budget and about 15% less than prior year. And that, a lot of this is due to timing and of sponsorship and donation payments. Um, some of those have caught up uh, by now. And then similarly on the, on the operating expenses, we were 29% less than budget. And, uh, and that, I'm sorry, I just jumped ahead. And a lot of that has to do with, again, timing of our uh, repair and maintenance expenses and, and other in travel and entertainment, mostly because some of our athletes uh, and our programs were not traveling and some of our, uh, our maintenance operations are just now beginning because of our whitewater facility opening actually in May. So, um, okay. And then uh, I am pleased to report that our, our EBITDA has exceeded budget by 120%. Uh, so things are looking good at this point, and uh, and also that the River Sport Foundation did complete and receive a clean audit for 2019 by Ide Bailey, and uh, the uh, 2020 audit is currently underway. Um, season pass sales are actually looking really good this year. We had uh, 100 last week compared to three at this time last year. So again, alluding to the fact people are ready to get outside and get active, I think this is uh, is exciting. Uh, we have currently 4,346 pass holders compared to 1,004 at this time in the prior last year. And, uh, and new units sold this year, we're already up to 853 compared to 515 that were budgeted to this point. So again, we're exceeding budget, uh, and I think that's really a, certainly a good sign. To remind everyone that season passes are 50% off through May the 31st. So. It is uh, time to get your pass. We've got a lot of cool, very exciting things in store for this year. So, um, and then I'd also like to share that Riversport was awarded a, 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 our second round of PPP funds in the amount of $815,200. Uh, we do have limited operations underway right now in our adventures. Again, we're delaying opening of Whitewater until uh, May, but uh, in, in, in Currently, we're in a, in a pretty significant cleaning and preparation process. Um, okay, so moving on to the next topic I wanna to address very quickly is uh, looking ahead, we're gonna have probably the single most important event we've ever hosted at the Oklahoma River this year in August, and it's called the ICF Super Cup. This is a, an event that is directly related to the Olympic Games in Tokyo, and we want this to be on, on everyone's radar and, and really be a celebration for the entire city. Uh, and we're going to kick things off uh, with our connection to the Olympics with a watch party and uh, for the opening ceremonies, which really will occur about one month prior to our Super Cup. This will happen on our new event center in the McClendon Whitewater Center. We've got beautiful, it's going to be just a beautiful uh, facility. I'll, I'll show you some images here in just a moment. We're partnering with Channel 4 on that. It'll be a fundraiser for our athletes that are 
are on their way to uh, hopefully be uh, participating in future Olympic Games, including uh, LA in 2028. So the Super Cup is going to be on August the 21st. It is we were selected in the you know out of the entire world to be the place to host this event, which represents a new form of, of a new style of racing or a new format that will is made to be very spectator friendly. All the Olympic medalists from Tokyo will come to Oklahoma City, representing over a dozen countries. It will be it will be broadcast live uh, internationally um, on Eurosport. It'll be live and tape delayed. They're going to play it in prime time uh, throughout Europe. And then it'll also be broadcast locally. Thanks to our partnership with KFOR, they're going to put it on channel 43. We'll have fireworks and a host of activities to engage the community, youth, and, uh, and really just be a total showpiece for Oklahoma City. I think leading to a lot of opportunities down the road. Um, it'll put us at the forefront, as I'd mentioned, with the television exposure, um, and we're going to be—we're really poised to become an international leader in the sport of canoe kayak. And the fact that we are helping roll out this new format that will likely be influential in future Olympic Games. Um, this is the calendar of events, and you can see all the things that are planned. Um, we will certainly keep you informed with with everything. Another thing to highlight is part of this event. It's not just the Super Cup. We're going to have a series of other events surrounding this, this event. One is going to be the ICF Extreme Slalom, which is, again, another new Olympic discipline that will debut in Paris. And we're the first one. You know, we're, we're rolling this out publicly. Uh, it's a big deal to have a new Olympic event. And we've actually been experimenting with this for the past two years. You can see it's where athletes go off a ramp and fall 10 feet into the white water and then they race to the end. We have one of the best venues in the world for this. And so we will showcase that as part of this event. And then we will also have the USO experience, which will be it's held in major cities across the US and they chose Oklahoma City in our boat in the boathouse district where we'll have thousands of active duty military vet in, uh, in military veterans and their families who will attend. It'll be during this whole Super Cup weekend. So very exciting that that'll be going on as well. Um, and we'll also have the national championships for both for the uh, American Canoe Association. So it'll be a busy weekend. We're doing a lot of planning and getting ready for that. I want to uh, quickly uh, share some some news regarding our diversity and inclusion initiatives or we call it our opportunity initiative. Uh, Councilwoman Nice has been working with us on this and we've really had some exciting things come together over the last few months had some uh, really great conversations. Uh, recently, we're, we're actually making some real headway getting a rowing program established at Douglas High School, which we're really excited about. We've got meetings this week on that. And uh, sorry, let me. And then we also just partnered with Course for Change in which we're going to have running groups that we host each week in the Boathouse District. Um, and they're going to be training for a half marathon here. And when they complete the program, they get River, River Sports season passes. So uh, just one more opportunity. And then that sort of ties to our Thrive Initiative, which I've gone over with uh, you before and shared that we're in our third year of this. We've had over uh, 1,400 youth served as part of our summer camp program. That's even with the COVID uh, pandemic. And and uh, repeat experiences are very important. So the average repeat experience is, is three. So kids coming out more than once. And we have a lot of plans in store for this summer and how we're going to continue to grow that and moving forward. Thrive is actually moving into other cities and they're using us as a model for what we've been able to accomplish. So I think that's very exciting. Uh, the construction projects are continuing with uh, through the MAPS 3 surplus funds. And you can see this beautiful second floor of the Whitewater building. It's really going to be spectacular over with decks that overlook the Whitewater facility, the river, our surf, uh, surf OKC, and uh, downtown Oklahoma City. We'll be able to have uh, 500 people in here for big events, or we can divide the spaces. This is where we're going to have a leadership center for youth and also uh, executives. So uh, only place in the world where you can actually walk out your door of a, of a facility like this and go rowing, zip, you know, zip lining, whitewater rafting, surfing, and now uh, soon to be skiing. And you can see the view from the deck and uh, how 
awesome that is going to be. There's decks on both sides of the building. We've had landscaping improvements throughout the Whitewater. All the mulch has been replaced with rock and a lot of drainage improvements that will improve the uh, water clarity. And we're still working on our filtration project. And we, we think we're going to have, be in a lot better position this season. And then Ski OKC is on its way. It's going to be installed in May. Thankfully, it's, it's being shipped from Holland. It was not stuck in the Suez Canal, thankfully, but it is it is on its way and, and that will be very fun to see that come together. We're, we're also working on a project called the Oklahoma Trailhead Project, uh, which um, is uh, an expansion of our pump track uh, with a trails grant that we're working on and a grant from the Community Foundation providing restrooms and other facilities. The pump track has been extremely popular through the pandemic and we've added a nature center and we and this will be actually a hub for our new trail network that will continue to be expanded here in Oklahoma City. Um, we're, here's our, you know, we, you can see a lot of the promotional materials for our opening events, our camps, our birthdays. Um, we have new packages, uh, uh, fundraising packages other nonprofits can participate in. Um, and so a lot of great ways that we're engaging the community this year. And then jobs, we have 200 jobs we need to fill. This is a great opportunity for kids in the neighborhoods around the Boathouse District and beyond. So please, we'd love for you to help spread the word on that. And uh, it's something we need to do is hire to make all this fun happen at the river. And then finally, Barquet is, is, is making good progress. We expect that project to start construction uh, here in a, few, in a couple of months. And, uh, and finally, uh, also we have an eSports facility that will open a temporary facility that will make way for a more permanent facility down the road. And that will be open to summer camps this summer and, and VR and other activities. And then finally, I'm gonna close with this. Roots, this is uh, Lake Overholster. We just wanted to direct your attention that we've got a new cafe that we've opened along with our mobile uh, flat tide operation, getting a lot of people on water out there. Councilwoman Nice re referenced her time at, uh, at Martin Park and. You know, this is just another gem for nature in Oklahoma City with our wildlife refuge. And I encourage you to come out and go paddle up in there, try our new Trailhead Cafe. It's, it's excellent. That, and this will serve as a model for how we uh, start our new restaurant in the new renovated Whitewater Center. So with that, that's all I have. I thank you for your time and we'll take any questions. Any questions for Mike? Thank you, Mike, for that presentation. Uh, looks like things are going good out there, so appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Todd? Councilman? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to uh, point out that right after items from council, we lost quorum for a short time. So in that, it was just an informal briefing that we were doing. I think we've got more room again now. We don't have any other presentations on our items, but we do have, um, I just wanted to mention the um, sales tax report. So we have the debt report, we have the council priority report, uh, and the sales tax collections, kind of along what I was saying when we talked about the stipend for employees. Uh, sales tax had a really strong month in March at 4.5% growth, just under 4.5% growth. We're still about 3.3% down below where we were last year, but well above budget. Uh, use tax had a 36% growth. A part of that was because we had a one-time payment that was over, I think, four or five months on a construction project. So it was paying for some back use tax. Um, even without that, if you factor that out, it's still at 17% growth. So overall for the year, use tax is just under 15% growth. So combined, we're at about uh, $16.6 uh, 16 .6 million above target right now with sales and use tax. So we're just in a very good position. We'll continue to monitor and let the council know. I expect our performance in sales tax to pick up when we hit, especially uh, May and June. I don't remember exactly where April was last year. I know it was down a little bit. May and June, without significant. so I think we'll top both of those months pretty easily, but we'll continue to monitor and report to the council let you know where we stand. So that's all that we have on reports. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Kenny, are we okay to move forward? Uh, I can't tell whether you have five members. If you if you don't have five members, the meeting is, is either recessed until you can get five members, or you can it can be declared adjourned. But you actually shouldn't conduct any more business. Is that including citizens to be heard? 
Yes. I would I would end it now unless we can recruit a fifth person from some unknown space. <laughs> I don't know I if don't anybody know if councilman I don't know if Councilman Max is coming back from Riverfront. He could just uh, temporarily put put recess the meeting if he's going to come back. You just need one more person. It looks like one, two, three, four. Yeah, you question. got. You have four right now. I guess the question is: Do we have any citizens to be heard? Yes, we have one. I believe we should probably find somebody. Right. You can, Daddy, okay. If someone's waited this long to speak, right. I'm sure hate for them to miss it. Put it temporarily on hold till we can recruit someone to tune in again. We're going to check on Councilman McAtee to see if, if he's going to be able to come back in. I don't know if they finished that meeting or not, but we're going to check on that real quick. Okay. James, council person walks in city hall. What happens? You, do you have a joke? Is it actually? Do you have it? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the punchline. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Hmm. I needed that mark because I was. I was starting to nod <laughs> into it, and I have to teach it for so <laughs> my one more espresso to make it through the day. Coffee. <laughs> okay, great. Bye. Yeah, Joe Beth may be getting ready to come on. I just logged She's in. Back on. Excellent. Thank you. All right. That takes us to citizens to be heard. Amy, you said the citizen is. Yes, Christopher Johnson. And I'm going to unmute him. Okay. Hello. Can you all hear me today? We, yes, can. we can. Hey, Chris. If you could yes, do us a favor, uh, give us your name and address and limit your comments yes. to three minutes. Appreciate it. Okay, my address 1714 Northeast 44th Street, Oklahoma City. My name is Christopher Johnston, and I am the national spokesman for the Oklahoma Coalition Against People Abuse. And I want to express, I hope the mayor gets to hear this, because once again, my community has another candlelit vigil for a murdered black man scheduled this week. The overwhelming majority of people in that jail are still awaiting trial, so they are not guilty yet of any crime. We have due process in this, in this country. The last time I checked, this was not communist Russia. This is America. My organization, the Oklahoma Coalition Against People Abuse, is representing the family of Mr. Curtis Williams, who was lynched in that jail a few days ago. When people saw nationwide, and are still seeing it nationwide, videos are being put out of human beings showing that this world systemic failure of this city and county, people living in filth and being beaten ritualistically. Chief Gurley needs to be fired immediately. There should be no question of his incompetence. Oklahoma City PD is the second most violent police agency in this nation, not Chicago, not New York, Oklahoma City. He made the order to kill. The situation could have been handled better. Human beings housed in that jail were demanding to be fed and to have a shower. Humans also working in that jail deserve better. We represent them as well. During a demonstration last month, a young lady talked about going through a stillborn birth in that jail, and she was not even given a pad, toilet paper, or even a shower within eight days. 
The criminal justice system is rotten from the top to the bottom. If our jail housed dogs, cats, they would have shut it down already. If our police were catching cats and dogs, they would not murder them. It would have been closed. I see more public concern from politicians about animals, businesses, rather than human beings. And yes, black folk are human. They are not three fifths of human. Now, Mr. Holt and other members stood by our Asian American family for the injustices that hit their community as they rightfully should. But yet when it comes to the black community, crickets. Now you said that they said, he said that he would support healing and justice. And according to the optics, there is nothing regarding our black family. So a question needs to be answered why enough of our city government never speaks out to hateful violence that falls upon our black and brown citizens. Are you actually going to do something? Because charity will never fix the structure. We have 30 seconds remaining. Friends. And I wanna end with this. They're protected under the 14th amendment and our organization is gathering affidavits. We have a legal team. We are suing the county jail. So we will have no qualms with suing this city. We are not playing games. You can either be partners and change or you can be opponents. You need to make the call. My name is Christopher Johnston, the Oklahoma Coalition Against People Abuse. I hope that you make the right decision because we're not stopping. All right, thank you, Christopher. Amy, did anyone else sign up to speak? No, they did not. All right, that brings us to item 14 on the agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.